For the record, my name is Matt Coda. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Fuel Dealers Association, which is a trade association of uh, heating and motor fuel suppliers in the state of Vermont. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding Act 250. Just for your background, um, I appreciate what an uh, enormous endeavor this is to address this planning plan in Act 250. Um, I served five years as a planning commissioner in the town of Plainfield, Vermont, and I'm currently the vice chair of the Development Review Board in South Philadelphia, Vermont. So I know the challenges with land use planning, I know the challenges with affordable housing and the inevitable uh, debates between neighbors when it comes to siting large-scale developments. <clears throat> That's just this background. My main concern here and why I'd like to testify, and I appreciate the opportunity, is to talk about uh, the provisions with regards to climate change in Act 250. Um, there are three essential questions that I have as I look at the text of the bill. Um, one is, um, from a planning perspective, are we dictating for housing developments, are we dictating what kind of heating equipment can go in? Um, are we requiring uh, any de well, housing development with oil or natural gas or propane to mitigate the emissions from them? And then how do you calculate those emissions? That would be an outstanding question that maybe the answer to already, maybe something that we have to figure out. But if you are having to buy carbon offsets, if you want to have an oil-fired furnace rather than electric heat pump, that's something that a developer should know before they create plans and supply, uh, supply for an active 50 permit. Um, commercial developments, such as those found in ski areas um, that have very large tanks, uh, propane tanks, you know, a ski area like Stratton or Jackson Gore, <coughs> have maybe 60,000 gallons worth of propane storage um, to, for cooking, for, uh, to supply the condo units with fireplaces and for heat, uh, and for water heating, for pools and hot tubs and such. How would they, how would they buy offsets for those types of developments? Um, or how would they mitigate that? Would they be required to have electric heat and not have uh, propane cooking uh, for, their, for their restaurants or, or, uh, or fireplaces that run on propane? Um, you know, certainly we know that you can use electric heat in Vermont. We know that electric heat pumps work. Um, they don't work in every application. Um, well, uh, well designed homes, you can heat electri electrically with the heat pumps much better than you could with resistance heat. Um, but it doesn't work in every application. And furthermore, we're a winter peaking state. So last night, the electricity that was powering the heat pumps that kept us warm was running on natural gas. 15 days in January last year, we used 84 million gallons of heating oil to run the power plants because there wasn't enough natural gas to run those power plants. Just for perspective, we use 75 million gallons a year of heating oil to heat our homes in Vermont. In other words, it took a year's worth of Vermont's heating oil to keep the lights on in New England for just 15 days. So say that one more time. 15 yeah. days we used how many? 15 days during the bomb cyclone. ISO New England used 84 million gallons of heating oil. It had to use heating oil because there wasn't enough natural gas to power the power plants. Typically during peak winter demand, uh, we rely on natural gas. But there's not enough natural gas, we rely on heating oil. And ISO New England used 84 million gallons in just 15 days. As perspective, we use 75 million gallons a year uh, to keep our homes warm. So the idea of oil-fired so, electric heat so Matt, is not this. Sorry. Could you clarify? I mean, our Vermont share of the ISO New England, or that, or were you talking about the entire ISO New England grids use? I'm talking about the entire okay. ISO New England right. grids use, which right. we rely on during peak demand. Yeah, which, which is distinct from the the um, the range, if you will, of the Act of 50 legislation. We're talking about back in Vermont, not the ISO grid. Yes, just, okay, good. Yeah, I just want to make certain I know what those statistics were from. Do you have your notes on here? I didn't see it online. But I don't. It's okay. mostly. Okay, will you be providing sure. it for me? Thank you. And the, the third comment, so one with, uh, you know, coming from a planning perspective, you know, how do you create both small A and little a affordable housing uh, if you have to buy offsets in order to install oil, gas, fire, heat appliances? 
Um, second, from a commercial development, um, how, do you, how do you figure out what your emissions are going to be with, um, when you have such multiple uses for fossil fuels, heating, <coughs> fireplaces? Uh, and third, how do you apply for offsets, or how do you mitigate climate change impacts or emissions when you need an Act 50 permit for bulk storage of fossil fuels? How do you build a Costco gas station uh, and get Act 50 approval under if this became law? Um, if your primary reason for development is to sell emission-causing fossil fuels. Can you say that again, that third? So, so if, I'm a, if I'm a seller of propane, and I need to install a bulk plant so I can sell propane to my customers, or if I'm a gas station operator and I need to put an underground tank so I can sell gasoline to my customers, uh, and I need to go through an Act 250 permit, as happens, not in every case, but in some cases, is it possible to purchase offsets? Is it feasible to purchase offsets in order to build a fossil fuel storage tank uh, if you need an Act 250 permit? Um, is it possible to mitigate that? In effect, I, I think the answer is no. So my response to the proposed legislation is that, particularly when it comes to siting gasoline, heating oil bulk plants, um, and uh, propane bulk plants, diesel bulk plants, what we're effectively doing is creating a ban on fossil fuel infrastructure in active 50 areas. And if we're not, then let's exempt it. Let's exempt heating oil, diesel fuel, gasoline, and propane from these regulations. Or let's eliminate the um, let's eliminate this requirement. As background, we sell 600 million gallons of liquid fossil fuels in Vermont every year. We sell 300 million gallons of gasoline. <laughs> we sell 100 million gallons of propane. We sell 200 million gallons of distillate. Distillate, half of which is heating oil, used for heat. Uh, the other 100 million gallons of distillate is diesel fuel used for on-road vehicles and off-road vehicles, such as farming or, or, or forestry. So we have 600 million gallons that we currently sell. We know we're going to sell less. We know government policies wants us to sell less and wants Vermonters to use less. We understand that. But we still, in the near term, need to store the fuel that we sell safely. Um, and we think we provide a good bargain for developments um, in terms of providing an affordable way to keep your home or your commercial home. Representative the, the we, when you say we, who is in we? Is that code of fuel or is that the state? That's, that's a great question. When I say we, I'm referring to the Vermont retailers of motor fuels and heating fuels of which VMPA represents as a nonprofit trade association. Yeah, okay. And, and I work for a, a, a 17 board of directors that are listed on vermontfield.com backslash contact. Thank you. You probably said this at the beginning. <clears throat> How many um, businesses do you represent? So we have about 500 retail gasoline stations in Vermont. There's about 150 uh, retail heating oil and propane providers in the state, uh, representing 10 to 15,000 uh, workers. All together. Selling 600 million gallons of fuel. Yeah, I was just thinking, uh, you know, this morning we're kind of a cold ride up here, and I know we have some cold spells every now and then. What, what's your supply in the state? I mean, how much capacity do you have, and how many days or months uh, do you have? On hand in the state. So we don't have a port, we don't have a seaport, we don't have a pipeline, at least not one with an off ramp, the Portland pipeline, but there's no way to get access. All of our fuel comes by rail or by truck, tanker truck. The average fuel dealer has bulk storage that would last them a day and a half in, in, in the winter. Um, tertiary storage is how most of our fuel is kept. Tertiary storage is the tanks at your homes. Um, your propane tank, your heating oil, your kerosene tank, that's at your home. That's where most of our storage is. And the careful um, transportation of fuel from Montreal um, by rail to the Valero Terminal in Burlington 
or by, to the Burlington Terminal from rail from Albany, or trucks going to the, uh, the, the Selkirk pipeline, which brings up uh, propane from Texas, um, or the trucks that are going to Springfield Mass or Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Uh, that's how we get our fuel, and so we, we are heavily dependent on rail and, um, and truck because the amount of storage we have is you know, gets you through a couple of days, and that's about it. Thank you. Um, Representative Morgan. <coughs> During the summer months, does any fuel come through the uh, locks up through the lake by ship, by boat? No, so not since 1984. If you go down to Burlington to Oak Ledge Park, you'll, you'll see the old dolphin, which is where they used to bring up barges of oil from Albany. Uh, that has stopped. Okay. Uh, that's been banned. So that, that terminal, oddly situated in uh, mobile, mobile terminal, now owned by Global Petroleum, oddly situated in Burlington's lakefront, because of that purpose, now it's supplied. Yeah. So neither Vermont nor New York utilizes water. No, well, uh, the Hudson River, New York. Uh, I mean, as far as coming into the lake. Yeah, yeah. no, to the Lake Champlain. Representative Odie McCullough. I'm trying to get this picture. So these fuels, you only have enough for one and a half days everywhere except for what's in people's homes and businesses, what they have in their tank. And so that's coming in that much every day. Every every day and a half, you're replenishing all those gas station tanks and everything else. Those tractor trailer trucks or are either picking up fuel from rail cars, with it's propane, heat, oil, diesel, fuel, or gasoline, or they're driving out of state to bring it in. So this is point of interest and really um, so the tertiary I'm imagining we in our homes have what a week average storage in our homes or not even what depends of course depends on the of time of the, of the year and, and of the course. temperature outside but but you know today last night you used five gallons of five gallons and you'll use five gallons tomorrow to not tomorrow night and, 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 yeah. and uh, you know so less than a month probably for the average home would have a buffer to get by half the homes in Vermont are eating, eating oil the vast majority of those tanks are 275 gallons yeah. uh, it's about 20 percent of Vermont homes have propane tanks and those vary in size because of the purposes and those are typically 240 gallons yeah. I'm just <clears throat> point of interest for energy security, this is really all I'm trying to get at. So I, I could go that out. That, from an energy security, we know that we're moving to electric car infrastructure. We understand that. Um, but we're losing gasoline stations. And we have good environmental laws in Vermont and across the country that, that require double wall tanks. This committee was key, under Chairman Dean, of, of ensuring that the tanks that go into the ground have to be double walled and then the single wall tanks come out of the ground. That's good environmental policy started by this committee. But but then it has that other side, which is why don't the mom and pop the country marks sell gasoline anymore? Because it's cost prohibitive. So we're losing gasoline stations. Over the past 30 years we've lost 40 percent of retail gasoline stations in Vermont. Um, over how many years? Over the past 30 years. Uh, if we uh, if we pass this F two fifty with the climate change, I don't know how you mitigate installation of the tank that sells fossil fuels, we'll not have another. In an active 50 permitted area, we'll never have another fuel tank again. That's an energy security problem. I agree with okay. that, that issue. Yeah. Um,
to Madam Chair? Yes. I didn't really have something in your Rather than asking Matt, while this, this is going on, I'll ask you. <coughs> I'm unaware. I'm unaware in the bill where where climate change says that um, or creates the issue Matt is talking about. Um, under Criterion 1, we create a greenhouse gas, and it has an avoid, minimize, mitigate. And in the mitigate, it says, right, uh, in that section, it says, under your body offsets, mitigate. So, um, what page is that? Um, I don't know the page, but it's Criterion 1 changes that we looked at yesterday with that one. Yeah. <laughs> It didn't seem that cut and dry to me. I didn't understand that. Yeah. I wish it did. generally talk about energy in, in Act 250, and um, I will be, I'll give you a little bit more about who I am and my experience here in Vermont, uh, look at, uh, just remind the committee of some of Vermont's energy and climate goals, um, try to address the question of how Act 250 can help support those, those goals, um, explain a little bit about a beneficial electrification, I'm not sure how, how much um, knowledge the committee has on that, but it's, I think it's important to set a foundation as we move forward and, and then have a slide of specifically um, some recommendations on, on what I think Act 250 should do to support um, energy efficiency. So just a little bit of background in terms of who I am. I've been in the energy efficiency field for about 30 years uh, in Vermont. Um, 21 of those were with uh, uh, Vermont Energy Investment Corporation that runs Efficiency Vermont. And then um, 10 years ago or so, um, we spun off and started Energy Futures Group. Uh, really, I've, I've got a lot of residential, uh, primarily, is my experience of certifications from LEED, uh, Home Energy Rating System, USDOE. Um, so know a lot about the, the building, but then also about the programs and policy as well, too. So trying to take the experience on the, in the field and apply it to programs and, and policies that can make sense. Uh, involved in the energy industry in, in Vermont and the chair of the Energy Club of Vermont, which is actually one of Matt Coda's uh, members. Uh, we're, a, we're a fuel dealer that is transitioning to become an energy services company. So the Energy Club of Vermont is based in Colchester and, and operates a weatherization um, business and we install cold climate heat pumps. Uh, we sell pellets as well as, as fuel. Um, so really trying to figure out how to become the uh, energy service provider of the future. So that's, that's an interesting challenge um, and trying to, to, to take what, we're, what we see the future being and try to apply it today and, and make it work. Uh, also on the board of the Building Performance Professional Association, BPPA, which is a trade association in Vermont uh, that represents the weatherization contractors, the home performance contractors. Um, and um, we've, we've had a, an organization, I'm, sort of the, the token non-contractor on the front of the project. So it gives, gives good insights into what's, what's going on in the weather station industry there. Uh, I live in Starksboro, chair of the Starksboro Energy Committee, uh, involved in uh, some Addison, Addison County uh, initiatives there as well, and then the mentioned partner in Energy Futures Group of, um, in, in Hinesburg. So EFG is, um, we're a seven-person firm. Uh, we we uh, have been we do uh, a number of areas of expertise focused on energy efficiency and, and clean energy as well too. Um, so that, that would include renewables in addition to um, in addition to efficiency. So you can see from the slide a number of areas of expertise. Clients really all over the country in Canada and do some work uh, outside of the country as well too. Our, our office building is the 150 old year old um, old police station on 160 in Hinesburg that we renovated. A couple of years ago, it's now a net zero office building. So, um, so we produce, uh, it's all electric. We produce all of our uh, electricity we use for heating, cooling, lights, and hot water from the solar panels you see on the roof there. So it could be done in Vermont. 
So um, in terms of a framework, uh, energy, is, as you well know, is, is core to environmental stewardship, one of the, one of the elements that's, that's um, uh, key in, in Act 250. Um, and as well, I'm assuming this, this committee acknowledges that climate change is real and needs to be considered. Um, and, and really, sort of the way we think about it in the industry is the three, three sectors. Um, there's the electric system, that's the grid, how we produce and, and use electricity. There's transportation, and then there's third. Um, so um, it, it's, it just helps to sort of uh, understand the, the different systems. And each one is, is unique and, and somewhat different, but, but has some overlaps. And then some frames to, to consider here as well that I'll, I'll um, dive in a little deeper on each one of these. But um, we, Vermont has a 90% renewable energy by, um, by 2050 goal that's part of the comprehensive energy plan. Um, there's also, uh, we've got greenhouse gas goals that are important to consider as, as part of your, um, your work in reframing Act 250. Um, and then we also have a, um, a, a goal to that new, all new construction be zero, designed to meet zero energy, like, like our office building, but that was, a, that was a retrofit, but for new construction, both uh, commercial and residential buildings by 2030. Um, and so uh, that, that is part, that's been part of the a couple of comprehensive energy plans, but those are sort of the frames that, that I thought would be useful for you to consider as you think about um, up, updating the plan. Uh, updating the active of the law. Um, and, and so as, as part of that too, just thinking about uh, each decision and each criteria, thinking about how efficiency um, works into there as well as resilience. Um, we know that, that climate change is having real effects and the way that we build our buildings needs to anticipate um, future uh, weather situations that, that may not be, uh, we, we may not have experienced previously. Um, so specifically, the uh, energy and, and climate goals. <coughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm nursing a cold, so uh, I sip of tea every once in a while. So um, Vermont's comprehensive energy plan has a goal, as I mentioned, of meeting 90% of our energy needs through efficiency and renewables by, by 2050. Um, so, so by design, that means we need to significantly reduce the amount of energy we use at the same time we need to shift off of fossil fuels towards renewables. Um, typically, um, typically, well, the renewables would, would include um, solar, wind, hydro, uh, biomass as well. Uh, we, we've got, as part of that, the first milestone is 25% um, renewables by, by 2025, and I'll, I'll show a couple charts in terms of, of where, where we stand with those um, from the uh, Energy Action Network. On the climate side, uh, Vermont is, is part of the uh, Paris Climate Accord as we joined a, a coalition uh, with some goals of, of 20, 26 to 28 percent greenhouse gas uh, emissions reductions from 2025 levels by, by 2025. So we have this 2025 uh, goal both on energy and, and climate that's, that's good to, to consider. Um, and we aren't, we aren't as, as a state doing as well as we need to be towards those. Um, we have our, also have our own statutes with, with even more ambitious goals uh, that set a 50% reduction from 1990 levels by 2028. So uh, those sort of build, build on each other. Um, so what, is, what does that look like? Um, so these, as I mentioned, are from uh, Energy Action Network's uh, 2017 annual report. They have a new one coming out in a couple of weeks. So these will be updated based on uh, the most recent data and information. But um, we, we've got in this, this green bar, we've got some, some work to do if we're going to get on the, on the trajectory uh, that leads us up to 90% renewable by 2050. So business as usual, you can see is the, is the dotted line there. And, and we're sort of in the middle of that, or in the beginning of that, that, that green zone where we need to, uh, by 2025, get, get, get up that, um, climb up that green line a little higher than where we are. Uh, so this sort of this next slide from their annual report last year also sort of shows where where we are. So um, the blue uh, represents um, uh, the the amount of uh, greenhouse gases that we've used since 1990. Um, this goes up through the data was only available for, through 2013, but you can see there's a 
a little dotted line at the end um, above 20, uh, 2015. Our, our greenhouse gas emissions have actually gone up the last couple of years. I'm not sure what we're going to find in the, in the next uh, annual report from, from EAN. But uh, we need to be on uh, that, that blue line, which, which brings us to 2025 with a, with a Paris Accord um, and also the Clean Energy um, Plan goals. You can see there uh, up, up, up above 2025. We've, we've, we've missed by a long shot the, uh, the bottom green line, which is the 25% reduction by 1990 levels that was set a number of years ago. So um, we, we, we're climbing in terms of greenhouse gas emissions when we really need to be on a, on a decrease in slope. So that's just sort of a, some, some, a reality check. Uh, and if, if these goals are, are really what we're striving for, we have some work to do. Uh, and, and I think that Active 50 can, can help, help lead the way there. Um, I mentioned as well that the third goal besides the energy and climate goals, we have a part of the comprehensive energy plan. There's a new, new construction zero energy goal that calls for all new construction be um, zero energy by 2030. So that basically means that all of the energy required for that building needs to be produced with renewables. Um, they, it needs to be, I actually should have put the word design in here, it needs to be designed to achieve zero energy because as we know people live in buildings and, and, if, and if they don't operate them the way that uh, they're designed to, then it, it may, not be, uh, may not meet those goals. But, but this is, this is a, an, an aggressive goal. California did this um, ahead of us. There are a number of other states out there that have similar goals. But 2030 isn't that far away, and, and it's hard to see this graph in these numbers. But um, um, while I'm, I'm not here representing the Department of Public Service, we are under contract to them to um, update the, uh, the, the energy codes in the state right now. As part of that work, we work with this National Institute um, National Organization New Buildings Institute to help us figure out, based on where we are, what it's going to take to get our buildings to the point where by 2030 we, we have enough space on the roofs to put solar panels and make those buildings zero energy. Produce all the energy for the buildings from the square foot of, of area on the roofs. Um, so um, that means that's again that's that combination of efficiency, you need to make sure that the buildings use a small enough amount of, of energy so that uh, when when the solar is put on those buildings, it can produce the annual amount of energy that that building needs. So basically, I'm not going to go through the, the details, but we need to step down from where we are at 49. Um, it, it, this is a BTUs per square foot target. So we essentially need to cut in half the amount of energy our buildings use to, to meet this standard by 2030. Can I just take a pause? Um, you yeah. said uh, I'm curious, uh, Luke, you said California has done this. They've set the goals set, or met the goals, or what does that mean? Good question. They set the goals for 2020 for residential and 2030 for commercial. Um, so they've taken, they took a step last year, it was in the national news, that they're requiring solar panels and all new construction now. Um, I don't think that the, the I think they, they're requiring something like two or three kilowatts of solar, which is not enough to it's about half of what a typical house might use. California weather is more mild than ours, um, so it, it might be it might be somewhere between half and 80 percent of what they use. But the, so they're taking a step in that direction. My my guess is that they'll probably that goal of having all new construction in California, residential construction be zero energy, might slip by a couple of years. But 2020 was their goal, and they're on their way there, but they haven't met it yet. And, and as well, the other states have set goals as well for different dates of having new construction be zero energy. Nobody has accomplished that yet. Any other countries have accomplished this? Or? Um, I don't know. Um, Representative McCullough. Comprehensive energy plan, is that the Vermont? Yes, the Vermont. Yeah. Be clear. There, this is our plan. This is our plan. We have, there, there are a couple, there's, a, there's I believe, a 2011 version and it, it was updated in 2015 um, and they and basically the 2015 version provided some more uh, some more detail um, and specifics that, that build on the 2018 plan. Yes, this is the Vermont plan. Thank you. Representative Dolan. Good morning and Good morning. maybe you'll get to the this um, but my question is to, to follow up on um, a point you made indicating that you're working with the new Buildings Institute to update the energy codes. 
I had heard um, two conflicting kind of um, perspectives on our energy code for the state. We don't have many codes, building codes, but we do have energy efficiency building code. And I had heard it's adequate, but the enforcement is wanting. And then I've heard it, it does need upgrading. Can you, can you shed some light as to how we're doing on our energy I spent code? spent a lot of time talking about the code. Okay. Um, well, I, I, can, I can hit on it. I can hit on your questions now and if you happen. I, I'm like, actually, I should have asked at the beginning. How much time do we have? I just want to make sure I'm. You have until 10 o'clock, so 25 minutes. Okay, I just want to make sure. I, I mean, I have a, I'm have halfway through my slide, but okay. I, mean, I have some so time. Okay, questions. stick to what you presented. Let's stay okay. on track to what you So can I, can I come back to that? Yes, absolutely. We can, okay. we can have you back also if you're able to join us. Okay. But I can, I can address that because uh, that, that, the code question when I get through the end. Because it is, it is one of my recommendations at the final slide, so we'll, it'll come up there. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so how can Act 250 help? Uh, I think it's important as you, as you develop the subject of the plan to ask whether <laughs> Each of the criteria helps achieve our climate ener and energy goals, I just, as, as, a, as a framework there. Um, we, there's, there's also, a, um, we have biomass as well as, as um, an important consideration in here, lo local fuel um, that, that is a renewable resource. Um, we should talk about setting the highest bar for energy efficiency when thinking about the best available technology. Uh, so specifically, criteria 9F has, has driven uh, as, as the, the terminology and a best available technology, and that essentially has been um, interpreted as being the, um, the energy code stretch code. So our, our code has two levels of efficiency, and Act 250 um, has required the stretch code, which is the, which is the higher level. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, uh, and as well, think about, uh, and it also mentions energy conservation. I see that you're proposing adding efficiency throughout the bill as well, too, which is important. And I just, the distinction I have here, just in terms of thinking, what's, what's, what, what is the difference between conservation and efficiency? Just thinking about conservation, it's turning off the lights as opposed to efficiency, replacing an incandescent light with an LED bulb. You, you get the same quality of light, uh, actually, you probably get better because it lasts longer but using less energy. So I think that's a good move that you're making to, to add efficiency in there in addition to conservation, which has been throughout the, the older Act 250 language. Um, think about this, this goal that we have for planning for zero energy design by 2026. And, and, then, um, and then I have a little bit of, uh, I'll go a little bit more into uh, beneficial or strategic electrification, sometimes it's called, but prioritizing beneficial elect electrification off of fossil fuels. So think about biomass and, and electrification as, as you move forward. So what, what, what is beneficial electrification? I don't know if this is helpful or not. I don't know if this, if this committee has, has had this conversation, but I'll provide a little bit of, of, of um, background or perspective. So essentially, I think, and I think that there's a lot of momentum, a lot of conversation happening. Uh, it started in Europe and it's grown to this country. All the states are, are having, uh, having this discussion now about what what does our energy future look like and, and electrification really seems to be sort of a, a pervasive theme. So the, the thinking here is that we need to transition <coughs> off of fossil fuels to meet our climate and energy goals. Um, at the same time, electricity is becoming greener. 43% uh, of Vermont's electricity comes from renewable sources right now. Uh, in fact, we've got a couple of utilities, Burlington Electric Department and Washington Electric Co-op are 100% renewably sourced. Um, and it, so at the same time, we also have uh, Vermont's Renewable Energy Standard, another piece of legislation that's a couple, I think 2015 is when it was passed. So it, that requires 75% of our electricity to be renewable by 2032, so that's statewide. Yeah. Is it on this slide, Bob, your question? Uh, 43% of Vermont's electricity is from renewable sources. Uh, the renewable sources include Atomic energy? Do they include um, water from Hydro Quebec? Includes Hydro Quebec. I don't believe it includes new. I, I know. Uh, in our overall uh, design for electricity, use of electricity in the state of Vermont, a year ago, 10% uh, of our statewide electricity was coming from nuclear plants. I, I, don't, I believe it's it's it still is. I mean we. Vermont Yankee shut down, but we are still purchasing uh, nuclear electricity from Seabrook and, and elsewhere, right. yes. 
I don't, I don't believe that the definition of renewable includes nuclear. No, I um, think the definition of carbon-free includes nuclear, and that's the distinction right. that I've heard made. Um, Representative Morgan? What other renewable resources? Wood? Wood, so McNeil, yeah. the McNeil generating plant would include Hydro Quebec is the big one, uh, wind and solar. Okay. Um, yeah, and so so as as well, um, we're sort of on Vermont sort of um, taking a taking a step in this direction in a big way in terms of beneficial electrification as, as, as through the renewable energy standards. So there really are sort of three tiers, and I should have probably labeled these tier one, two, and three. But the way that the, the, the legislation is organized, tier one requires seventy five percent renewables by twenty thirty two. Tier tier two requires smaller scale local renewable sources. So not only buying Hydro Quebec power or or large wind, but also uh, encouraging the utilities to, to meet that 75% through a mix of smaller generation um, sources as well. A lot of those are the smaller are, are the solar farms that, that we, we might see. And then there's a tier three, which is really this is this is one of the more innovative um, policy approaches that Vermont has taken that, that nobody has. And I you know I I. I talk to a lot of audiences outside of Vermont, and, and this is one of those uh, initiatives that I think makes a lot of sense and is really on the right track. So, um, so th this this piece of <coughs> the renewable energy standard requires utilities to basically wean their customers off of fossil fuel use. So they've got some some goals that start out moderately, but they grow over time, um, and it, it, the, the utilities are basically encouraged or by because if they don't meet these goals they get penalized and have to pay into a fund uh, to help their customers um, transition off of fossil fuels. So for instance Burlington Electric Department by meeting this is is transitioning they're buying electric buses and so they're not burning fossil fuel. They're, they're about to bring in, in a couple buses there. Um, Vermont Electric Co-op has helped sugar makers extend um, the electric power lines to sugar houses so that they can, so those sugar makers can run their equipment off of electricity instead of burning diesel in their generators. Um, Green Mountain Power has helped um, Lum Johnson Lumber, A. Johnson Lumber in Bristol, um, bring in uh, three-phase power to run their kilns and their equipment, so they didn't have to run diesel generators and burn fossil fuel. And then, and then there's a lot of residential programs too, the heat pump programs that some of the utilities are running, weather station as well. All, a lot of those that the distribution utilities are now offering and running are in support of these tier three efforts. I think, I think in Heinsberg you had a new tier three installation of a Tesla power wall yesterday or this week. Yes. Uh, that green on power, power. Will, buy, will buy power back person yes from the power wall that they're storing electricity on. So it's a, it's you know it it's um it's a great way to uh, encourage utilities to innovate and and it, and it puts them on the path towards electrification and it's in their benefit to promote this because they sell more electrons and and that actually benefits all ratepayers because it spreads it spreads their fixed costs of poles and wires over larger number of sales. So it's a it's a it's a win win really if it, it, it reduces our fossil fuel use uh, it's in the utilities' interests um, for keeping costs down. It's in all of our interests for meeting our, our climate goal. So it's it's a it's an it's an innovative initiative that, that that's out there. That um, while it doesn't directly pertain to Act 250, I think it's important for you to understand that we've got these larger goals that are moving us towards electrification. The utilities are sort of on board as well, helping us get there. So um, I think this is probably a good spot to ask this question. And it's your opinion on distributed generation in the state of Vermont versus um, um, a merchant generator. Um, and so the merchant generators that we have are, well, we, our, our commercial wind projects would be mer commercial, uh, merchant generators. Um, and those electrons, we're having trouble getting them to their end users, which are largely out of state. Um, so could you comment on on future the future of large generation projects in Vermont, renewable generation projects in Vermont, 
versus distributed generation and, and, and the need to um, promote one, one over, over the other. other. Thank you. Um, my, I'm not an expert in this area, but I, I, I do think that if we're going to meet our lofty goals, we're going to need all of them. Uh -huh. And I don't, I, I think in the energy world, uh, we, we don't have clear, we don't have one clear winner. We have a bundle of different resources that we need to bring together on the efficiency side and on the, on the supply side, on the production side, if we're going to meet our, our climate objectives. Um, we've got a lot of work to do, and I think we're going to need to figure out how to have both merchant um, providers and, and um, smaller scale projects. And do the, do the electrons that leave the state that we make here help us qualify for our our Vermont goals? I don't believe it, although I can't, I can't answer that for sure. Yeah. It, it depends whether, whether the uh, reps. Our our reps, reps are sold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah right. That, that's right. Thank you. Representative <coughs> Smith. Yeah, I was just thinking of the biofuels. Um, you know, most of the biofuels, uh, they're carbon-based. So what, what's the trade-off with uh, using biofuels versus uh, petroleum-based? Well, I, I think biofuels are another piece of the solution as well, too. Right now, most of the biodiesel that, that we see out there is really low. It's 5%, maybe, maybe up to 20% at the most is biodiesel blended with, with fossil. Um, so when you buy biodiesel, you're, um, there are a couple providers in Vermont, and you really, you really have a hard time getting it in the winter because it, 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 it gels. But most of them are really predominantly fossil-based and very little biodiesel. But I, I think that the, um, did Matt leave? If Matt, Matt were here, he would, he would, he would, he could report that um, his national industry, NORA, the National Oil. Or the oil heat industry is doing a lot of research um, because they see their way out of this fossil fuel conundrum that we're in by moving towards biofuels. Um, liquid fuels are have a lot of benefit, um, and and we, we if we could replace oil with biofuels, there isn't much that needs to be changed in our systems. But right now, um, they they are still predominantly fossil based. I think it's part of the part of the solution. Um, as as is solar and, and wood and, and these other sources as well. Okay, thank you. So where do we stand? Uh, how renewable are we right now? Um, so as a as a state, we are um, we're not quite as green as we would like to think. While the electricity you can see on the right, so these pies are all relative to the total. I, and I sort of talked about the um, the, the three different buckets um, that initially the uh, electricity. Transportation and thermal. So the total, we'll start on the left with total. We're, all, we're about 20% renewable right now. Um, thermal um, is about 20%, transportation is only 5%. Most of that is the biodiesel. Um, that's where that 5% renewable and transportation comes in. Some, some EVs, some electric vehicles, but a lot of it is bio, uh, biodiesel mix. And electricity is at 43%, as I mentioned earlier. But if we're going to move that high on the left to 75%, I'm sorry, 9% renewable by 2050. We've got a lot of work to do in each of these sectors. Um, why electrification? I mentioned mostly supports Vermont's climate energy goals. It's cleaner, can be more affordable, uh, produce it locally. Uh, it's a way to prepare for battery storage in the future. This is going to be a huge way. We, we, we talked about the Tesla power wall that Green Mountain Power had a um, news, news event yesterday on. We're the, the price of batteries is coming down significantly. Um, the, the Public Utilities Commission is looking at, at rates that will encourage time of use rates, which will encourage us to put batteries in our buildings, hopefully if they get it right. Um, so it's going to be the ability to, to integrate um, with distributed resources, solar PV, but then also our cars. If we can plug our electric vehicles into our homes at night and use that for storage and use that for managing the grid, that's going to be a huge resource, and there's some great work being happening out there too. So, electrifying our building stock moves us in this direction and supports the rest of these technologies. Most of you are probably familiar with some of that 
some of the equipment that's out there. Uh, I can spend a lot of time, but I'm not going to, talking about, about heat pumps. Um, so this equipment works in Vermont uh, as long as you specify a cold climate um, uh, models. 20 below winter last year, our building did fine. Uh, just maintained 70 degrees uh, year round. Um, there are other heat pump technologies as well. Heat pump water heaters, which basically extract heat out of the air and, and are twice as efficient as electric resistance uh, water heaters. Electric vehicles and industrial equipment um, are, are all support the electrification. And, and biomass as well. Um, so your uh, biomass is, has positive aspects of being a local renewable resource. Um, there's some great programs and initiatives out there. Advanced wood heating systems replace central fossil fuel systems and community projects too, like the, the district heating plant here in uh, Montpelier. So um, with all that, finally, um, what, what, what do I recommend um, that you could do in terms of Active 50? So continue requiring stretch energy code. I think that's, that's pretty easy to do. Um, and and um, so the residential building energy standards, or RBs, is our re residential energy code. CBs, commercial building energy standards, is a commercial code. Um, the, the stretch code's about 15% higher than the base code for, for each, for RBs and CBs. Um, right now, we are, um, uh, we're about to put the updated um, language out through the rulemaking process. The Department of Public Service, uh, we're, we as an Energy Futures Group, as a contractor for the Department of Public Service, has been working on updating these. We've had stakeholder advisory group meetings, webinars, presented at the Better Building Design Conference. So with all that input, they're ready for the 2019 version, which will go into effect in, in 2020. So these, the, this next version of the code um, sort of addresses your question, Kerry. Well, will be a, a, about 20% higher on, um, 15 to 20% higher on e in each of the codes. So moving towards, I showed you that uh, New Buildings Institute step of how to get to 2030, we're making our way uh, down, down, that, down that step. Um, so in addition to making sure that the, the code is supported uh, as it is right now, um, uh, and this gets to your other question about code compliance as well too, you're absolutely right, we don't have any statewide code enforcement mechanism. We have a couple cities that have code inspectors. They aren't energy experts. They're primarily looking at health and safety issues. Um, they might ask whether there's the builder has a, cer a certificate. Um, there's a certificate, a, a CDs or RV certificate. It's a one-pager that uh, the builder signs off on that they built the code and checks off some of the spe specifics of the, of the property. It's supposed to be provided to the, uh, on the building, fix the building somewhere on the, on the electrical panel, uh, sent to the town clerk, and also a, a copy go to the uh, Department of Public Service. But there is no statewide enforcement. There, there is, um, so let me get through this and I can circle back about some, uh, well maybe I have it here. So, uh, so the documentation of energy code compliance, um, that some, some mechanism for Act 250 projects, really all projects, but the jurisdiction of Act 250 is what we're talking about here, making sure that that certificate comes back to somebody in the process. Because right now, a builder or developer says, I'm going to build the, to the energy code, and off they go. Uh, there's no verification that they actually built it. So if they could provide that RBs or CV certificate back to an authority having jurisdiction, I'm, I'm not even sure who it would be. But I, I, you know, you know and, um, I think that would be that that would help ensure that there's a um, that, that those projects meet the energy standard. You're talking about rural building, right? Not in like a town that has code enforcement. So there's no code enforcement in towns like Burlington. It's B towns: Burlington, Barrie, Bennington, and, and maybe Rutland. Right. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Right. So you're talking more rural. But even Williston or or Colchester, I mean, there's not there's not a code official. There's not a building. Nobody's looking at the energy code in any of those jurisdictions outside of those few cities that have a, a code enforcement officer. Right. That's all I was trying to. Get. Yes. Yes. You're absolutely right. Yep. Thank you. Um, so right now, there there the um, the Home Builders Association, the Passive House Alliance, the Building Performance Professional Association, the AIA, the architects and other groups have come together. Uh, they have a consensus group that, that um, and they will be presenting to the legislature 
shortly um, two recommendations. One is that all builders at least be registered with the state. So the Office of Professional Regula Regulation is, has a piece of legislation that they're looking at. But right now, we don't even know who's, being, uh, who's building homes in the state who call themselves a builder. And there's no way to, for, for opportunities for education or letting them know what's, what's happening out there. Um, but it's a precursor to ensuring that, that there's a level playing field, that all homes at least get built to code. That there's an effort to register builders uh, amongst all the, the building groups that's underway. And then also a code enforcement suggestion as, as well. So we'll, we'll see where that goes. But to, back to your question before, that there, Harry, there is, there is no enforcement outside of those, those municipalities. Um, and so some way to ensure that those builders that are building to the law that are, most of them are active 50 builders, um, you know, they, they do, they are building the code, um, but their competition out there um, that is not necessarily building the energy standards, and so that puts, a, that puts them at a disadvantage. Um, so requiring all electric or biomass heated buildings as, a, as another recommendation, future proof our building, prepare for an uh, electrified future would be a, a, great, uh, a great component to include in Act 250. Um, and then as part of this too, as we know, our transportation sector is moving towards electric. Um, we heard Matt acknowledging that as well too. Um, think about charging stations in all housing developments to get, to get ready for that. So, and with, with that, um, you have my contact information. I'd be happy to answer questions or come back another time if that would be helpful as well. Um, so I, we also I, I, I let ledge council know that we might need a little we'd like a little more time with you so we we could do our next agenda item at ten fifteen. Okay. So we can have a good conversation with you and Representative Smith. Yeah, I was uh, so that I can understand a little better. Can we go back to the building that you you picked up in Hindberg mm -hmm. and, and rebuilt it? Yeah. You said it was uh, really tight and uh, energy efficient. Tell, tell, tell me what you're doing there. It, it's totally supported by those solar cells. It is. Yep. It is. We have we the natural gas line runs right under the sidewalk out front, and we chose not to hook up to it. We don't want to pay eighteen dollars a month, and we don't need to because we can generate all our you know that's just for the hookup fee plus the use of gas if we can use it. But we we designed the building so that um, uh, so that we had enough solar production over the course of the year from our roof square footage to meet the needs of the building. So we took the 1850s farmhouse and we basically did a gut rehab. So we built new walls, uh, two by four walls inside and, and basically filled it with a foot of cellulose insulation around the perimeter. We replaced the windows with triple glazed windows. We paid a lot of attention to air sealing details so the building is very tight but it has two mechanical ventilation systems in there, heat recovery ventilation systems that uh, that provide uh, fresh conditioned air. Uh, it's actually, our, our office is in half, we built a, a, half of the building is a new construction. Um, and, and um, go back. I'm familiar with the building, so I know um, what's no Yeah, so the white whole. part is, is our office, and then we have three rental spaces out front, and it, oh, you can't see the rest of it. The, the, it's about half the size of the red building out front. And so there are two offices upstairs and, and one downstairs. So the, and then, the whole building is heated with um, with five heat pumps. Um, each each floor and each space has its own head, so it can, has individual control for heating and cooling. And um, and then there's a heat pump water heater in the basement. The basement is fully insulated as well too. So it's a it, the envelope is tight and well insulated, so it doesn't lose or gain much heat. And and the heat pumps provide all of the heating and cooling and the total amount of Electricity that the building uses is produced from the solar panels. In the okay, so do you have a square footage cost that, that would be associated with? I'm trying to think of if somebody wanted to renovate, you know, their home and meet that kind of a standard, you know, what that would mean. Or if you're building a new building, uh, what would that add to the construction cost? Um, well, we also we have no we have no energy costs in the future now too. We basically prepaid all of our energy costs and rolled it into our mortgage. That's how we looked at it. To answer your question, 
we calculated that because we presented on this building at, at, at not not the Better Buildings by Design conference this year, but last year. And all the all that information is in our presentation there. I'd be happy to send that to the committee. I don't remember what it was. It wasn't out of line. It was um, for a commercial office building. It was it was in it, it was a couple hundred dollars, but I don't remember exactly what it was. Yeah, well, the reason I'm asking is because we're talking about finding solutions to affordable housing, and I'm wondering if we hire something like this on buildings, what that would add costs, and I'm really fascinated with what you've been able to do with your building. Yeah, well, the, the affordable housing groups in Vermont are doing an excellent job in this area. They, they get it. They're, they are taking this approach in many of their buildings, um, and they're, they're realizing that if they can take the, the expenses, central heating systems out of these buildings and take that money and invest it in the building envelope and put in less expensive heat pumps, um, they can achieve much lower uh, operating costs. So there's a, it's a balancing act between um, envelope and equipment. And given, given where the output of the solar panels has come and the cost of heat pumps has come down, um, we're, there, there are a lot of opportunities to do the same thing that we did with, with other affordable housing projects. Thank you. Yeah, Harvey's <clears throat> brain and my brain work together sometimes. He had the same questions I was going to have, but I, I am curious as to what you spent to remodel that building to get what you got now, and were the grants involved that you didn't have to pay for? Uh, we did, actually, I need to finish submitting our rebate to Efficiency Vermont because there's one after after you've been in a building a year and you can demonstrate that you the standards that we see the there. So we, we did get um, uh, we did get a 30% solar tax credit uh, as the three partners that built the building. Uh, it's available to everybody. We did uh, participate in Efficiency Vermont's uh, zero energy building. What's it called? Right? I don't know. But there's a top tier for the commercial building program um, that we participated in. Um, the building uh, cost us about $700,000 all in. So that was purchase, renovation, um, and, and as we like to think about it, we prepaid our energy bills forever. No, right? I understand what you're saying on yeah. that, but there still was cash that you're, you're paying for. So, yeah. so I hope we can segue to back to Act 250. This is all very okay. fascinating, <laughs> but this, we have Richard just for a few more minutes, and we're trying to get his input on the Act 50 changes that have been proposed. So. ask my question on it just to do this segue. Um, so in the bill as it currently exists, there's language around uh, avoid minimizing Medicaid in the new criteria one of you. Have you had a chance to look at that? And we just heard from Matt Coda who had some real concerns about uh, carbon offset requirements and mitigation. Is, is that anything you can help us understand better? Uh, no, I don't know that I, I don't know that I can specifically. <laughs> Have you looked at that section of the avoid minimize mitigate for construction? I did not look at that section of the bill. Okay. Okay. Um, Representative Nolan and Odie. I wanted to go back to a point you made, and this somewhat gets to this about um, equalizing the playing field. You had mentioned that um, that some builders who are trying to comply with the codes are at a competitive disadvantage, perhaps because um, other builders may not be um, complying to code and therefore can offer lower costs, perhaps. Could, can, can you, that, I think that gets into some of the incentives for the structure of this bill on how to, how to structure in such a way that we level that playing field. Can you elaborate a little bit more about that point? Uh, Claire, sure. That? So, so every three or four years, the Department of Public Service does uh, a statewide, they do, two, they do a number of statewide baseline studies to understand how our buildings are, are being built in terms of energy efficiency. And the last one, um, the, 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 the most recent one hasn't come out. It's, it's due out, it should have been out by now, but it, it's, you know, it's about to come up. But the last one showed that about a third of all new buildings are built to code. And, and are there indications that that won't be significantly different from the, the most recent study? So 
what the builders say is that this isn't fair if they're trying to comply with code and somebody else is bidding on a project and, and they're coming in at lower cost because they're not building the same energy efficiency standards. And do you think that rather than having a whole system of, like they've got in the, those three, possibly four towns, if, if you linked, you talked about a year later you get a rebate if you show that you that you meet the, um, the whatever standards there were. So do you think that rather than having a whole new infrastructure that would cost something to, if, if you really just said we would do a structured rebate program, that that would incentivize people enough to meet the the enhanced building code or whatever it's called. I can't remember now. Stretch code. Stretch code. Yeah. That that might do it rather than we, we will never Vermont will never fund a statewide code enforcement mechanism. So I I, I didn't have enough time. I to, thought they were thinking about it. Well they, they want to enforce it somehow, but it doesn't have to be through having individuals in each town. There are other creative ways like requiring uh, half the towns right now that have certificates of occupancy require that this RV certificate be provided. And that's that's a great way of if the builder's signing off on a on a certificate that they've built the code, they, they better have done that because there's a chance of liability if somebody finds out later that they haven't. So so it's that and we also now as part of the new code we will be requiring that a blower door test be done with every new home. This is a key measure, it's been part of the national uh, model code for a couple of years, but Vermont has opted not to adopt that. We've got 130 blower door, certified blower door testers in Vermont. Um, the, the cost is relatively minimal to have that happen, but we know that air leakage in buildings is, the, is probably the number one opportunity for, for energy savings, and um, so there are probably some creative ways of, of having some of those blower door uh, air leakage testers provide some insight as they as they do that work. With, you know, but again, because we know that not all builders follow the code, or, or is everybody going to hire an air leakage tester? But if there's some if there's some check along the way, if, if, a, if a bank, as part of the mortgage closing, required that the RB certificate be provided, or closing attorneys had it on their list, along with the town clerks. Um, there's some other creative ways. We did a whole study actually on this uh, for the Department of Public Service five years ago on innovative ways for co-compliance um, that we could look at acknowledging that Vermont's not going to pay for infrastructure of individuals. So is it your testimony that if we require this, there are creative ways to meet this going forward Definitely. that would not that would meet goals, but 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 not be too expensive. But, but not you, you could structure it so it doesn't cost the general fund anything. In, in reality, how about people? And well, the, the, somebody's going to have to pay for those right. services. So the the developer or the builder, uh, who's the one who benefits most likely, would probably be the, the best entity to pay for those costs. In the end, where this is, this has been done in Massachusetts and Pennsylvania and, and New York State, they, they actually find that um, the, the builders benefit from having a third party set of eyes in the building to look at things that they've overlooked that their subs might have done. And, and you know, so that there's, some, there's some unanticipated benefits that come with, with having uh, an energy professional in the home who's there just to look at air leakage and, and but beyond beyond the economic development opportunities for a, a large number of independent business people, there are other benefits that will end up improving our housing stock at the same time. Okay, we have um, Faye, Dolan, and McCullough. Yeah, thank you. Uh, your earlier testimony from a uh, fellow in the wood business, they talked about a combined heat and power plan in terms of a, a something made of uh, biomass, fed by biomass, it would both heat up, say, a sawmill and provide its power. We said the problem today to do that, to convert and go in that direction, was because it would require a permit from both Act 250 and, and the Public Utility Commission. 
And I'm just wondering in terms of your your talk about social efficiency and seeing buildings that kind of are uh, independent, have their own kind of system like that. How how does how do we make that distinction? How do we go forward with make sure that the the, the, the right regulatory agency was the one that had the whole had had complete jurisdiction, so you wouldn't have to go through both. You would get it by going through one. Do you have any on that? Uh, well, I can speak from experience in going through permitting of our building in Heinberg that we've been okay. talking about. Um, and I, I must admit, it was burdensome. It took us a year and a half. We had to go to the stormwater permit and 50, and it, 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 it certainly would have been more expedient and easier from our perspective to have one deal with one entity and and have clarity up front about what the steps were as well too. Go, going into it, we're, we're energy consultants, we're not building developers. So, um, and and um, we, you know, we were working with the town, we actually bought the property from the town, so they were experienced. Um, we had to go underneath their Act 250 permit as well too, so maybe that complicated things somewhat. But, but having a clear path forward and, and understanding what that is from, from day one, um, certainly would have made it a lot easier and less expensive for us. So I don't know if that addresses your question, but um, from personal experience, um, that, that, that would have been a, an easier um, solution. It would have gotten us to building sooner than, than it did. Do you have any opinion as to which should have that kind of jurisdiction? I don't. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't you know. Did, you, didn't, you didn't do the PC process. No, we didn't have to do the PC process. Yeah. So yeah. 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 Um, I can't remember the order, but hopefully you won't do it. Um, no question. <laughs> All right, I'll call that. So, um, first some homework for you, please, and then second, a brief question. So you were in the room when Matt Dakota was speaking, and and um, he is, he is rightfully very concerned for his entire industry. Um, but I'm not so convinced that he needs to be as concerned about our Act 250 bill and how it's going to affect fuel storage and, and selling of fuel per se in the state. And, I, and, and, and if, you, if you would, um, please help me understand and, and, and the committee understand how the climate change a uh, section in our bill really would affect the, the transportation, storage, and, and sale of fossil fuels, um, per se. He's even talking, he, he, he was even saying, how are we going to even put in a storage tank? Right. Um, so if, if, if you could look into that and give us some insight from your perspective <coughs> how how Criterion 1, um, I, think, I think it was Criterion 1 that, that it was concerned Criterion about. 1. Yeah. Um, and and um, my, my, my knock-off question is right here on the screen. Um, uh, EVIC, charging stations and all housing development, why, why not commercial? Commercial and, and, and industrial oh, as well. Probably should say that as well. Too. And, okay, and 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 um, when you get to that level, we're going to need. So there needs to be a certain number of handicapped parking spaces in, in commercial and industrial projects. We would have to have an understanding of how many charging stations per square foot or per anticipated use in that building. And, and maybe that information is out there somewhere and you can find it. Well, we, the, the next version of both RVs and CVs, the, the, the codes, do speak to increasing uh, the number of um, EBSE locations to, to be level two ready. That is, when you're, pay, before, when you're paving, before you paint the parking lot, lay in some conduit, leave some space in the electrical panel, um, for future use when there are more vehicles that need to be serviced. So you can feed the wire out, put in the facility in the parking lot, you can add the, the circuit breakers to the panel, and you're ready. It's not going to require a lot of expense. So 
for a little bit of upfront uh, anticipation of where the future is, um, you can start to get these, yes, you're absolutely right, just a commercial as well as housing development projects ready for the future. Commercial industrial. Commercial industrial, yeah. yeah. Not just housing. Yeah, right. Thank you. Uh, I, I guess I do have a follow-up question. Um, you had described on your particular project the, um, the uh, level of um, fit up to accommodate your needs. And, and I imagine some of it would happen anyway because you're using it for your business. <clears throat> um, the other portion, though, is, is the uh, investment in weatherization and, as you described, the net zero benefit. And um, I think the information related to that with respect to um, your return on investment or the, um, the payback period will be helpful to know uh, since you've, as you mentioned, you've upfronted those costs into your mortgage, avoiding those ongoing um, costs of fuel, ongoing maintenance costs. Uh, I imagine you could bring that all into uh, net present value to determine the we, payback. We, and we did. We did that for that presentation yeah. a year and a half ago. Oh, okay. So I'll just have to go and pull that out. Okay. I'd be happy to share that with Thank you. Me. I'm curious if you have other witnesses you think we should hear from, that people you know of that we could help with the informants on this topic. Um, the broad topic of climate change changes to acting. Are, are you talking to, to uh, Jared Duvall from Energy Action Network? Uh, the, I mean, the, the, the charts that I pulled from come from his organization, and, and they're, they're a nonprofit, um, sort of non-aligned non group that basically is the only entity in the state that's looking at these three sectors, the electric, uh, the electric sector, thermal, and transportation. All the rest of the pieces are divided up amongst the agencies, and, and, um, but they're trying to look at how the state as a whole is, is making progress and, and should be uh, meeting our 90% renewable energy by, by 2050. Well. So I, I, he might be useful to hear from. Okay. Uh, we need to wrap up. I just want to say, who's we'll asking ask. them to do that work? Um, their board of directors? I, I mean, it's sort of they've been, the state has, I'm not sure who has tasked them with that, yeah. but it's, there is involvement from state agencies and the Department of Public Service and UC and, and others. But they have a board of directors, includes the SECU and, and other nonprofit organizations as well, too. So I'm not sure. Um, you know, I know that the High Meadows Fund is, uh, has been a supporter of, of their efforts. And so I don't know if it's just a philanthropic initiative, um, but there was a, there was a a lack of any one entity in the state doing that, so they were formed a number of years ago to take on that task. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Shift gears, committee, for a uh, turn towards our appropriations letter. Uh, so we can get done. It's due today. And then I'm going to ask Peggy if she wanted to put a little bit of the but that will still give you a couple of hours. Um, okay, and thought we were going to have someone from Legislative Council join us. Yeah. Eric, I'm Right. I'm sorry. I didn't recognize you. I'm here. I'm here. Okay, so Michael sent us two updated letters. Did you post those? Yeah. Let's see. Great. Are they under Michael? Yeah. <laughs> So folks who are back there, they're going to have a situation here. Somebody, I don't want to take it. It's somebody else. It's yours. Okay. 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 Because I'd love to go from Is it your? Yeah. You guys, right. can I put this yeah. down? Yeah, it's just a part of the I might want to do it. Do you want to know about the chat with you guys? Oh, I'm going to be here. So if you walk them to her, in case she doesn't see the text, I'll plan on that unless okay. I hear differently. Okay. I think we're leaving. We have to leave a little.
Richard Lee? Yes. 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 How do I find this on my iPad? It's under Michael O'Grady as a witness to to today. today. Yeah. Which, uh, and it looks like Michael's here to join us. Just at the right moment. Let's job and see if that works. <laughs> nice, dude. We went to Jen and Ansel. Yes. Yeah. Let's the Calvary King. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. Katie Toll, the appropriations letter. We're just looking at paragraph or bullet item four. Michael, is so cute. Do you want to walk us through this? That would be great. Um, I, I'm not sure what you want. Just to help us get through it. Or we were just going to read it ourselves, but. Okay, well, um, you asked for uh, two recommendations from the Governor's Climate Commission to be added into your letter. One of which was to use the Volkswagen Settlement Funds for electric vehicles. And the other was um, regarding doubling the funds for weatherization, both of which were in the, the Governor's Climate Commission report. Uh, much of the language is drawn from that report. Um, so in the last page, you'll see the committee supports two of the Climate Commission's recommendations using the VW settlement funds to provide incentives for the purchase of electric vehicles and two doubling the funding of weatherization programs in the state. Do you have a warrant? Does the committee have any questions about it? I miss it. Okay. Um, great. And then uh, this letter we have is the updated one you sent us. We're Changed. In the appropriation letter? Yeah. Sure. On um, the second page. Um, under BHCB, <coughs> you wanted uh, on the targeted approach, I, I wrote a new line, new paragraph then. It's the second to the last paragraph on page two. VHCB's target approach to conservation heights. Our committee support for fully funding the board for selective in its conservation land, focusing on important natural areas. Threatened and endangered species, habitats, wetlands, and floodplains that enhance the resiliency of our landscape and lands and provide um, critical habitat for wildlife. That's drawn directly from the board's summary of its conservation efforts. Moreover, land conservation in general has returned on not nine to one hundred. <laughs> and that one dollar invested generates nine dollars in the department. I literally was writing this at five this morning. 
Just a decimal point would fix it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you also wanted to reference how VHEV has been working with Ag Water Quality Program. So the last sentence of the paragraph right above that. Okay. Above that. It says VATV additionally has provided significant support to farmers investing in our community agricultural water quality projects. And um, you wanted to reference intergenerational transfer and having new people enter the sector. Um, and so in the last paragraph, Third sentence, VATV also utilizes this process to help the next generation of farmers and foresters on land to start their careers. And these solutions benefit the state as a whole. Uh, then, yes. on fish and wildlife. Um, uh, yeah, I have a question. We have a question, like, I guess, on the um, I know that VHCB also, their investments also help to meet our um, TMBL goals, water quality goals. And if you could state that up front, it um, just reinforces less funding we need to worry about for our water quality goals. Sure, remember you make that added? Um, and we know, um, let's see, I have the very other state. Um, um, we understand conservation protects natural resource fragmentation and degradation as, as well as uh, achieve our clean water goals, help us help the state of Vermont achieve clean water goals. Which paragraph are you on? Under the moreover paragraph. You can either tack it on at the end of that rather long sentence, sorry, <laughs> made it even longer. Or you could say in the next one, VACB's conservation of land is important for meeting the state's clean water goals as well as it's uh, already in there. Tool. VACB uh, additionally has provided significant support to farmers investing or implementing. It's more than it's. I'm talking, I'm talking about the conservation of floodplain and restoration is a passive approach to achieving our um, restoration of our natural resources, both floodplain, river quarter, and wetlands, and. And that helps, that's required of the TMDL, so the these restoration actions. So I just wanted to highlight the water quality benefit from that conservation work in sure. meeting the TMDLs. Sure. Okay. Um, and the Department of Fish and wildlife, I took out that uh, paragraph regarding the um, increase uh, fees that you recommended to the Committee on Ways and Means. And so the third paragraph is new. To offset its budget shortfall, DFW originally proposed to, proposed to become programs important to the support and protection of the state's fish and wildlife, including the hatchery, grants, and UVMs. Research unit and fishing promotion sounds great. Right. However, the department has since offered an alternate proposal of increasing all individual license fees by two dollars and all foundation license fees by five. This pro proposal will close much but not all of the budget shortfall for the FW and FW this year 2020. The Natural Resources Committee supports the license fee increase proposed by DFW. The committee strongly recommends that the committee and appropriation fund other revenue to close the remaining FY 2020 budget shortfall. They believe that the state should not have to fund important programs to meet the budget shortfalls. And then the rest of it's the same. Representative Odie. Um, in the paragraph to offset its budget shortfall, so the department has offered an alternate proposal to increase all of individual license fee by $2. Okay, so, and the other one by 5 So what did they do about the people who were 67 getting permanent licenses? Because we thought they should stay the same. Well, that's, I don't know what they did. Um, but that's neither an individual, well, that is an individual, I suppose. I don't know what they did. So what do you think we should do about that? Ignore it. Yeah, I don't think it's, it's, it's doesn't, doesn't matter. We gotta get this letter in the All right, well, I just, today, so I, people, yeah. yeah. Minor changes suggested, getting a couple zeros out from a number and 
Oh, I'd like to have the whole thing proved, and that should only take 20 minutes. Yeah, that's great. And then, but then I can just read it and we can send it. Yeah. But I'm asking everybody to approve right now. I know we're supposed to do this quickly, but the only reason I'm bringing this up is that thing was such a big deal that we actually had to make a, a new bill about it in the beginning of the last biennium. And I'm concerned that if, if we don't address it in this letter and then it goes through and it's to everything, then we're going to. I think the department wanted to propose that because they were experiencing that as well. But we can find out. We'll find out. All right. If we need a sentence in there, we'll put it in. And that's bring up one more thing. But Representative Shy has a bill about disabilities. Not having to pay anything, but that's a different thing. That's, that's yeah. Okay. So okay. Is everyone okay with the letter the way it is? Except okay. for the one thing that I. And the. Do you want to? So, do you need a motion? Yes. I move. Thank you. <laughs> I second it, but would that include the slight addition to add uh, clean water ob objectives for the TMDLs? That's what I was requesting. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I second that. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Okay. I'm saying I don't know if we're voting on. We're voting on sending this letter to appropriation. Okay. You don't want to do it? Okay. Um, let's look at the water quality funding letter. Is that what we would also like to get going for? What were the changes that were made here? Um. Really not that much. Uh, the numbers on page one, the 25 and the 33, remember I had the wrong numbers in, um, so I corrected them. Uh, that's kind of it. Oh no, Senator Representative Browning's language on page for the Natural Resources Committee has been signed 864. It's introduced by Rep. Browning. Related to finance and water quality programs, the committee has reviewed 64 briefly once the committee can make for further review. Yes. And I, I believe we made a slight change um, to the paragraph beginning with however under A, just to give um, more generally that the um, increase is to acknowledge the O and M costs, as opposed to directing it for. <coughs> mm -hmm. Is it in there? Yeah, I think it looks a little more page two? general. It looks a little more general there. So it's good. I, you know, I did this late last night, so I don't, I don't have total recall. <laughs> I think those are the changes. Yeah. All right. So, we ready? Representative Terrence. Um, was it just your your name on the letter and, and the vice chairman, or whose name is going to be on this letter? I think it says the majority of the committee somewhere in here. Yep. Um, and then my name. It doesn't say all of the committees. All right. So what I'm saying is your name is going to be on this letter and nobody else. Correct. And the. There's a sense in there that says the majority right, of the committee. Very good. Thank you. I'll make a motion to approve this. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay, great. All those in favor? Signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Me. Okay, great. So, does this one need to go to innings? No, this one has been through out innings. Great. So, we, I will move that um, the 71 go to Ways and Means today when we're on the floor. Folks are ready for that. Right. So, then we'll go with this letter. How would you like it delivered? Usually. <laughs> 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 um, uh, normally, the chair will sign it and scan it and email it. Okay. So, I can come and find you sometime okay. before the floor? Sure. You did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did. Thank you, Tom. All right, so we're going to go to the next 
Um, okay, can we take five? Yes. Come back. Yeah. Give me seven, but please come back there. 10.40. Cross time so you can keep going. Yeah. Thank you. Come on, move. <laughs> yeah. Good morning. Fine, thank you. This is the worst seat in the whole entire place. It is or it is not. Huh? It is or it is not. It is. Yeah. You don't have much backup area there. I don't. <laughs> oh, what's wrong? I have slightly more here when I'm not You shouldn't have said anything. They're going to push the table over this yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Have you ever had like an executive session? You could have, but, but it's difficult having an executive session. You could have a session where you 
discuss the deliberative session. Correct. But when you're here in this building, it's kind of hard to have an yeah. executive session. Because, because you know what we say is so important. Exactly. I, exactly. It's like Mr. and Mrs. Nosy Body are here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I forgot the camera set. <laughs>
I'm Peg Elmer Huff, um, and I live in Cabot. And I'm representing myself as a citizen here just from uh, because I'm a veteran land use planner in the state. And I've got more than 40 years uh, really in the trenches um, and the front line of a lot of the issues that you're addressing in this legislation. <laughs> So I was a town planner, a zoning administrator, administering Title 24, Chapter 117 in Chittenden County in the 70s. Uh, Shelburne, Jericho, and, and Richmond. And then I went to the Environmental Board when Darby Bradley was chair, um, administering Act 250. I was trained in the details of Act 250 by Ed Stanek, who I know you heard from, and he's one of the best. Um, I was recruited from there to work for Len Wilson, who was the secretary of the Agency of Natural Resources at the time, and stayed on there um, when Jonathan Lash took over. That was just before they had deputies. Um, there are no deputy secretaries and deputy commissioners at the time. And Governor Cunin had very high expectations for the Agency of Natural Resources. So I was hired to do special projects. It was maybe the best job I ever had. Um, and one of those, th one of my daily jobs was to coordinate the Act 50 Club, which I inherited. It was happening for a long time, but it, I don't believe it exists anymore, which was a weekly meeting on Fridays with all the state agencies, representatives from all the state agencies. And Friday afternoon, I put together an entry of appearance to go to the district commissions, summarizing the positions across state agencies, not just on Act 50, but we did that on FERC and uh, Section 248 and all, all state permit programs. Was that the development cabinet, or did it become no, the that, development cabinet? No, this is cabinet? pre preceded that. <coughs> wow. Um, and that had been in place for a long time. I don't know why it went away. Uh, but uh, another thing that would happen is I was uh, loaned to Governor Cunin to staff the Governor's Commission on Vermont's Future, um, which led into Act 200. And when Act 200 passed, I moved to DNRC, really pretty much Kate McCarthy's McCarthy, the position uh, 30 years ago to really work at stirring um, and, and supporting citizen involvement in planning because that was just really trying to get a resurgence going um, on local plans, uh, regional plans, and citizens being involved in that state agency planning that was um, going into place for the first time. Um, but in the process of, of doing that as well, I, I was doing, trans uh, so I was the registered lobbyist on Act 200, Act 250, and um, jumped into alternative transportation, the beginnings of that, and created a little um, alternative transportation <coughs> here in the legislature. And Mary Sullivan, Kurt McCormick, Ken's brother, were brand new legislators, and they, they've all, they're all back here. <laughs> and I believe Kate's doing something similar. Um, from there, I went to the, the Commerce Agency when Bill Scholes was secretary and led the state's smart growth efforts for probably more than a decade. Uh, Sumenter was part of my staff during that time and we had her concentrating on uh, programs that were state funded like smart growth because of the Hatch Act when she was here in the legislature part time. Um, and during that time, the disaster started hitting hard and fast. Um, I didn't include a picture here of the all the flooding events that were occurring then. And emergency management just didn't have the capacity at the time to deal with the amount of money, millions, coming into the state to go out to towns. Uh, and hazard mitigation was new. Um, DHCD, where I was working, Department of Housing and Community Development, has all that structure in place to send money to towns. So um, I and my staff uh, dealt with hazard mitigation funds for uh, quite a while. Um, and Part of that, in 2005, FEMA started requiring a uh, state hazard mitigation plan in order to get those funds and some means of having local and regional hazard mitigation plans as well to be eligible for those funds. And so my staff and I drafted the first hazard mitigation plan. And that was when, under Governor Dean, um, the development cabinet was put into place. Um, and a, the development cabinet didn't meet that often because it's really hard to get all the secretaries in the same room at the same time. Um, it's pretty extraordinary, actually, how, how little they were, we were able to get all of, I don't know, I don't ever saw them all together. Um, but there was a sub-development cabinet that was a staff like me, and we met every week. Um, 
And when it, so then it, from there I moved down to the law school to teach land use law and policy. And while I was there, I was appointed by the governor to uh, the smart growth seat on the downtown board. So I served on the downtown board for a number of years. So I, I just tell you all that to note all the pieces of this bill that I've been involved with. But I want to focus on the private piece of you today because I feel like there's some holes and I'm, I'm not sure you're hearing from the people that would fill those holes. And I can get you started there at least. Um, because that, I, I, there's so much that Act 250 can do to really uh, affect what we can do to adapt and mitigate climate change on the ground. You've heard plenty of testimony and you have a lot of expertise on the energy issues like this morning and on flooding, greenhouse gas reduction, but there's very much that Act 250 influences that would lessen our future impacts from power outages and heat effects. So uh, what I'm going to do is show you the state has a mitigation plan was approved in November, just this past November. So it's very new, very broad effort. Have you had any background on it at all? Okay. So and I note that it's approved because um, I remember the concern in Act 200 about having regional planning commissions approve local plans. A lot of furor about that. FEMA requires that Region 1 approve every last little um, local hazard mitigation plan, and they're very tough to get through. They all, almost never approve it the first time through. It's a rigorous process. Um, but, so that's why we say not adopted November 2018, but approved by FEMA. Um, and it's one of those state plans that Act 250, particularly if you're updating it to address climate change, should be noting um, and uh, coordinating with other state policies. And thankfully, you can see here that the state's mission and goals echo the policy foundations of Act 250 that you've been working on. Not a lot different. The plan works from natural hazards data, this particular plan. Uh, they can address man-made hazards, uh, and the plan that was in effect at the time Tropical Storm Irene hit uh, was very big on terrorism because it had been written right after 9-1-1. Um, this plan just focuses on natural hazards and develops the state's priorities um, for those hazards. And I, I, I put in the screen table so you can see the process uh, where they try to come up with an objective. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, they try to come up with a process to more objectively score which are the, the worst hazards for the state. And this is done through a, a very public process with a, a, a broad steering committee. And you can see that flooding, winter storms, fluvial erosion, and ice storm rank as the most significant hazards. But then tied right after that, you see wind, heat, drought and landslides. Um, so I, I'm going to get into the war warming piece and how that's affecting us. But the, the northeast region of the country is the fastest um, warming area of the contiguous in the United States and is warming at a rate of 50% greater than the global average. We're predicted to experience increases in heat waves, intense downpours and flooding, more heat, less cold days. Actually, it's hard to believe that we're going to work now, but the trend line, this so if you have trend lines and they just keep going up. We're wetter and rainier in the winter, and the summer is when we're just getting less rain, where we're actually beginning to have drought creeping in, certainly the summer in the southern part of the state. Um, so less soil moisture. FEMA Region 1 in Boston is um, demanding that we start thinking about forest fires, like the, with the being dealt with out west. So more frequent and intense storms of all kinds. Is local hazard mitigation plans in most towns at this point, and they're very much ramped up from um, the experience we had with tropical storm hurricane that had a major effect on us. And I, the, I, I really sort of twisted what I do in li life to community resilience and hazard mitigation after our um, because of the experience of having administered FEMA and my broad experience across all planning. It just um, was helpful to really get into that. So the next thing I'm offering you is. Um, these pies from the St. Johnsbury plan, pie charts, that um, that I produced, but these pie charts look the same, very, very similar, and the percentages don't change all that much across the state. So on the right-hand pie, you see um, a massive slice of blue that's flooding, because that is by far the most costly kind of event that we experience in, in terms of dollars. 
But the events that impact us most often are the three on the left-hand side. That left-hand side is how often these things are happening to us. Um, those three large pies, uh, the purple, green, and light blue, are um, winter storms, wind, and cold storms. They add up to 84% in the case of St. John's Bay, the declared disasters, but it'd be about 80% or more of the, of the declared federal disasters that we experience in Vermont. So power outages, extended power outages, are a thing that we experience a lot. We've been having them at home in my house this week. Um, and utilities are leading the way, planning and constructing microgrids, and we heard from Richard Fazy about battery storage being the way. Um, I was disappointed for years with, uh, it's great that we've been doing so much net grid, net grid work on photovoltaics, but when the grid goes down, those houses go down too, and we, there needs to be a different answer for that, and that's where battery storage comes in. So just stop and think about the combination of extended power outages with extreme cold and heat and it becomes more deadly. And think about how the design of development can help mitigate discomfort and avoid that misery. I wanted to, to give you some numbers from the Department of Health on that. People on the um, Act 50 Commission have been hearing me on this from a bit. So this, this information is just from the Vermont Department of Health on, on climate. <coughs> If you were to have someone come and speak to you, it would be Jared Ulmer um, from the Department of Health. His position is on uh, climate impacts. And but hot weather, just uh, the, the biggest extreme there is in red. The Vermonters are at greater risk for serious heat illnesses and even death when, when the average temperature reaches 87 degrees or hotter. The National Weather Service advisories are set to go off when they hit 90, and we're at risk earlier than that. Um, the Vermont data shows that on days when the state average temperature reached at least 87 degrees, there was one additional death per day among individuals aged 65 and older, and eight times more heat-related emergency room visits. We had seven deaths during Irene, our last deadly flood, eight years ago. And you can see from this that there are, we're having more death, and you're not hearing about it enough, uh, from heat. Um, the health department has just begun really um, keeping the data on when somebody's death certificate says heat, and just two years ago. And we've, they're happening, but most often those heat deaths are you know, heart failure or stroke or, or something else combined. So Vermonters are particularly at risk because we just don't have much experience with hot weather. Um, we're not pre well prepared at all. And so do we want to see everybody put in air conditioners? I don't think so. That's not the answer. And there's so much that we can do in the orientation, um, design, and construction of our built landscape to help us be better prepared. Some of the best illustrations come from work in the 1970s in the energy crisis when Jimmy Carter was president. And it just, it's galled me. There's been so much waste that has happened over the last 40 years and not having done more about that. The design options not only increase comfort, but also increase affordability and the life cycle cost of, of buildings. So just adding the language, I asked at um, the Act 50 Commission's public hearing, and that was, it wasn't a hearing, it was a public meeting for gathering public input in South Royalty, and there was a woman on the district commission in my table, and I asked her if they asked these questions, and she just said, you know, it's, the language isn't there, and we're supposed to be consistent across the districts. Um, nobody's pushing us to do this. So just to have the language in the criteria would make it, that district coordinators and commissioners ask would make a huge difference for the landscape architects, the architects, the engineers, knowing that they need to, to address that and demonstrate something. And without, there's no further study needed, no appropriation. Um, and then another piece of information, there was a little lady at the public hearing that um, I was running for the Hartford Hazard Mitigation Plan who hadn't said anything all evening, uh, just sat there quietly and I, she made the effort to get there. So I asked her if she had something she wanted to add and she said, uh, she piped right up. She said, I live on the fourth floor of a senior housing building in White River Junction. It's all electric, the heat, the stove, the refrigerator, and the elevator, my neighbor's in a wheelchair. 
What do we do when the electric when the power goes out? Um, so just having questions to get people to ask questions. And then I added this graphic from uh, the 1980s. I, 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 the, the planners the other day were pushing back on saying that the changes, these things should be happening in local regulations um, and working from the ground up. But Act 250 has really pushed uh, across the board changes over time. So from the 1980s, just from the Criterion 3 water conservation, it became just um, performa, that performa that you, when you went to the plumbing supply house, you'd only find low flush toilets. And that was because of activity. The same with our values and in, in insulation and what was understood which was built. And it was much more than was happening in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, other places. And we'd hear about that in the local homes that came into the state too. Um, that we were far above the HUD, the HUD standards. And electric heat, of course, that's all turning right around now, but um, electric based water heat was just understood by the population as being anathema, as being too cheap to install and too much to pay for over time. So you can lead the way with Act 250 and have a very large influence, even if it is just 30% of the top of the development that you see. So I, I have um, a handful of questions. So some of the some areas would like not to have 250 apply to them, and you s said um, just having a question to ask makes the building better, makes the landscape architect have to you know, think about it and so forth. What would you say to the places where Act 250 doesn't apply to have them ask those same questions? In your you mean you mean in, at the local level? Mm -hmm. I, I can tell you, I have, a, I have a PowerPoint from 20 years ago on this, on right. putting it into local subdivision regulations and zoning regulations, and it just doesn't happen voluntarily. It's, um, I think if you, if you, are, you can only really affect what you can do in Act 50 in this legislation right now. Over time, maybe it will happen in the local regulations. Is that your question? Well, since your answer is that, then my question is, should Act 250 or have a piece of that or should it be a separate legislation? It would probably be chapter 117 on the regulatory side. Um, and it's, all of these things, I mean, I, this is the first, when I was um, doing Act 200, that was the planning half of Title 24 that, that covers what the planning what the municipalities do. And then when I was on, working for Howard Dean, we did the regulatory half. That was, the, and it was based on, uh, it was triggered by a housing affordability. Um, and that was the last time that was done, but Act 250 has not been looked in this, in this <coughs> comprehensive way that I can remember. Um, it's, it's been honed and polished and picked at year after year, but not looked at in this way. Um, it's a huge effort. It doesn't have to come around very often. It's only you know 25 years, or you know, in this case, it's 50 years. It's about 15 years that Title 24 gets looked at. There is an effort that the planners have been pulling together to look at the regulatory side again. And that's where you want to, um, and looking at the planning elements, um, it's, I don't think it's right yet. And uh, so it's, it's, I think you've got enough you're trying to handle okay. right here with Act 250. But in, <coughs> in another year or so, yeah, please go after the, um, the regular choice side of Chapter 117. So uh, actually, though, I think to what I thought I heard Carol asking was we're considering enhanced designations. And so should, through, should that process include? Some of the language that you're suggesting. Enhanced designations are sure. good. So you, you, the downtown board hasn't really looked. It did start looking at floodplains after Irene. Um, it's really a historic and economic development program. Enhanced designation. Wow. Um, I haven't seen that you were including language there. I think it's been it's been in the hands of the administration to kind of put together a task force and make recommendations and what would be included. Oh no, we have language now for the for the so yeah for the enhanced designation language. That, that's okay. I'm well, sorry, I didn't, I didn't look at that. That's fine. Yeah, Representative Odie has a question. Oh, Dolan. Uh, I I also this is more of a comment, but we are also looking at the consistency between local planning and regional planning, and that too may be helpful to ensure that we're achieving that kind of con that consistency could be helpful in trying to achieve these 
overarching goals of greater energy efficiency and weatherization? That's, that's on the planning side, which is, you know, general. It, it would be on the regulatory side where you'd actually get change on the ground. Um, and so, yeah, you can get any enhanced designation. That would be great. So I, I did include um, just some, uh, just a few language changes to include employee orientation and criterion one and landscaping. You can do so much with, tree, with just plantings and uh, earth burns. Earth sheltered housing. Um, uh, some of this is uh, my suggestions are for fluvial erosion as well. It just seemed like there could be more tweaks to address because what we get are those flash floods that do an enormous amount of damage in a short amount of time and knock out roads and bridges. Um, so a couple of those are just where you have the criteria to deal with that erosion, really call out um, that it was the steep hillsides. So under energy conservation and efficiency, I think that's where you could get the most of just um, incorporating building and landscape design and maximize passive heating and cooling opportunities. And I was glad to see that you have somebody coming to talk to you about the passive house, but just it doesn't have to be an expensive design. It's really if you had roads going east-west um, in a subdivision so that all the houses then tend to be have a large base. Um, either front or back, but south, you know, gain a lot. Um, and then on settlement patterns, uh, this comes from her, the work in Hartford um, and the little old lady and thinking about, they have a section of Peachy Highlands development that has never been built out, all went through Active 50 and was very professionally reviewed at the local level. It has one access and after our meeting they realized it's really, it can't, it can't really go forward the way it is. And, it should have been, it's a lot harder to do that after other pieces of property have been purchased. So just to, to ask the questions during Act 250 would help a lot. And then adding the reference to having mitigation plans um, to local and regional plans. <coughs> Over time, the as the mitigation plans, the push is out there to have them incorporated into town plans, but right now they're separated um, and they're very detailed. Um, things that affect land use uh, it should be about at the same time. So thank you. That's all I'm Can you tell us how are hazard mitigation plans used now, the statewide one and the local ones? Towns need to have them in effect in order to be eligible for the hazard mitigation money that comes from FEMA um, after a de declaration. And if it's by county, so if you have a, a, a federally declared disaster in a county, all the towns are able to then um, they, they want to have uh, pri priorities laid out in their local plan for, you know, doing some work on, um, say, the Burnham Library in, in um, Lincoln, if anybody's familiar with that, was uh, rebuilt with um, hazard mitigation money. The fire station in Lindenville was rebuilt with, to be flood, more flood safe um, with hazard mitigation money. And now you need to ostensibly have reference to those projects you need in your plan. Um, and it's competitive to get the money. So if you've laid it all out, specified what you need to be doing in town to um, be more resilient in the future, it helps to get the money to do that. But do towns use it more proactively? Like, I mean, or is it really just to, to access funding and show that you are going to meet the plan after the disaster happens? Well, that's the argument for select boards to get them to move and, and uh, update the plan. They're required to be updated every five years. So quick, quick, I'll return. FEMA Region 1 will not approve it unless you've got an implementation chart in the back that says um, who's responsible, by when. Um, it, it, you can't just say ongoing as, as you know, by when. Uh, they're, they want specific. They're really pushing for action um, at, at the, on the ground. And, can be um, uh, congratulated for really pushing the envelope uh, much more than usual usual plans. All right. Any questions? Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, next up, we have David Snyder. Um, your testimony? 
I did. I apologize that I submitted it earlier this morning, but I did bring, did bring hard copies in there for everyone. Okay. And it is up there. I see it. I just okay. Executive Director of the Northeastern Vermont Development Association. Uh, we're the regional planning and development corporation uh, that covers the Caledonia, Essex, and Orleans counties, the Northeast Kingdom. So, um, again, thanks for having me. So, uh, I noted on the, the on the agenda that I've, I've been given quite a bit of time to speak. I don't think I'll use my full allotment of time, but um, I was able to be joined by um, Adam Luigi from the Addison County Regional Planning Commission. And if, and if he would be allowed to give say a few words as well, that would be really appreciated. Sure. And a fellow RPC. So, so beginning, um, Chair Sheldon and members of the committee, again, thank you for the invitation to speak with the committee on the proposed changes for Act 250 in local, regional, and state planning. It is important that Act 250 and local permitting processes support community, economic, environmental, and use planning goals at all levels. It is also important to have permitting processes at all levels that are predictable in both time and expense that minimize duplication at all, of, all levels of review and have permitting responsibility resting at the appropriate level of government so that community and or state goals that protect the environment while allowing for community and economic growth can be achieved. Uh, the Northeast Kingdom region um, has 50 uh, municipalities, more than 50 municipalities, and it covers approximately one-fifth of the state's land area. Uh, the area which MBD has served has long been the most rural and economic, economically challenged region of Vermont given our low incomes, typically high unemployment, and limited development opportunities. At the same time, our communities have preserved a high quality of environment that, in my opinion, exceeds many areas of Vermont. Uh, what we've observed over the last decade is that uh, more municipalities uh, are adopting municipal plans, and, and this number has increased significantly. When I began at MBD back in 2002, of our 50 towns, we probably had maybe 28 or 29 that actually had municipal plans in effect. We're now in the mid-40 range, uh, because I think towns are now seeing that uh, planning is important, and uh, so, so they've taken the steps to give themselves a greater voice in state permitting processes. Um, as to the types of developments that we see in the rural Northeast Kingdom region today, we see the establishment of barn farm enterprises, things like breweries and, and greenhouses. Uh, home-based businesses. We, still in, we see infill redevelopments in designated and non-designated uh, areas utilizing existing buildings. And we see a lot of place-based uh, outdoor recreation developments. Um, that's really popular now with given the uh, vote rec opportunities and uh, interest in trails and outdoor recreation. Uh, we are concerned that proposed changes to Act 50 will inhibit some of this development and negatively impact our rural economy. Uh, regarding some of the proposed changes, uh, beginning with the revisions to and greater use of the capability and development plan, uh, renewing the use of this uh, CDP is a positive and potential to improve activity 50 review uh, by creating additional predictability. As proposed, the process for developing the CDP is top down. Uh, we would argue that the process should be bottom up. Uh, I think there's a lot of local knowledge and um, local input that would be very valuable. We, this happens a lot as we do our regular municipal planning and regional planning. Uh, all regional planning commissions have uh, mapping programs and undertook a similar process with mapping when we uh, did our recent energy plan updates uh, to get improved standing in the Section 248 processes. And we believe that the best planning begins at the local level. Uh, regarding the requirement that to be used in Act 250, local and regional plans must be approved as consistent with statutory planning goals. We believe this is already happening. Uh, there's already a process uh, under Title 24 for reviewing and approving the consistency of local plans. Uh, regional commissions are required to approve a plan if it finds that the plan meets the following uh, conditions. It's consistent with goals established in the statute, uh, 40, Section 4302. 
Uh, it's compatible with the regional plan. It's compatible with approved plans of other municipalities in the region. And it contains all the elements included in subdivision uh, 4382 um, of this title. Uh, creating another review process for local plans would be duplicative and problematic. RPCs have recently, recently been given the authority to certify local plans seeking energy compliance if they adhere to all the requirements for that certification. We think if um, local plans do need to be certified, regional planning commissions would be the appropriate uh, entities to do that certification. Um, regional planning commissions were created by member municipalities and it is the representatives appointed by these municipalities that adopt the regional plan. Uh, 24 BSA uh, section 4348 outlines the requirements <coughs> for all regional plans and all regional plans must be consistent with the goals established in 4302. Uh, prior to hearings for adoption, regional plans are submitted for review to the following. The chair of each legislative body in the of the, the municipalities in the region, the director of each region, a budding regional planning commission, the Department of Housing and Community Development under the Agency of Commerce, uh, interest groups that may re uh, request uh, notice in writing, and the Agency of Natural Resources and the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets. We also submit our regional plans uh, voluntarily to agencies of transportation, uh, Vermont Emergency Management, and other uh, agencies that we work, regional planning commissions work with on a regular basis. It's important to note that any of these uh, foregoing bodies or the representatives may submit comments on the proposed regional plan or amendment to the Regional Planning Commission and may appear and be heard in any proceeding with respect to the adoption of, of a proposed plan or amendment. Uh, very recently, the Department of Public Service has been given a review and approval role for regional plans as RPCs pursue determinations for energy compliance. And they, again, this was to give us a greater standing in the uh, Section 248 um, certificate of public good process. Now we have a proposal for the Natural Resources Board or a new environment, environmental board to determine consistency of regional plans with statute. Uh, this seems problematic, for, especially for the NRB given their role in the regulatory process. Uh, state agencies and entities have different responsibilities and goals of their own and sometimes those may be conflicting. Uh, in our, it's our opinion that giving more state entities a review and certification role takes responsibility away from the municipally appointed regional planning representatives that have the authority to adopt the plan. Uh, next, regarding Act 250 jurisdiction in, in enhanced designation areas and expanded jurisdiction in other areas. Uh, the state permit process should encourage development in appropriately planned places and carefully consider or discourage development outside of those areas. Reducing or limiting or eliminating Act 250 jurisdiction in existing and planned settlement areas are delineated and approved by municipalities and regional planning commissions when local regulations and development review processes are robust. Um, existing state designation programs are both complex and constraining, and creating a new designation will add complexity. Uh, the designation, de designation programs aren't designed to accommodate the whole range of settlements that exist in Vermont's villages, downtowns, and surrounding areas. Uh, we agree with the VPA testimony uh, that was provided as, to this committee that defining areas uh, for limited Act 250 jurisdiction should begin with areas identified as suitable for future growth in the municipal and regional plans. We agree with comments from the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission that improving and expanding existing designation programs will be better than creating a new designation. Uh, the proposed changes for Act 250 will greatly expand jurisdiction even into areas where development may be appropriate, including working lands and critical resource areas. Many Vermont villages and downtowns are located in river, along river corridors. In my region, those communities like Hardwick, Lindenville, Barton, and Orleans villages um, are, are along river corridors. And these communities can have and continue to make investments in buildings and public infrastructure. Limiting Act 250 jurisdiction in communities like these, all with robust regulations for existing designations, is robust, or is appropriate, excuse me. Uh, the Regional Planning Commissions, uh, so the Association of Regional Planning Commissions, VAPTA, will be putting forth recommendations on the use of river corridors uh, in state permitting processes in the near future. Uh, lastly, we also agree with uh, some of the following comments. Uh, delaying changing the jurisdictional elevation triggers from 2,500 to 2,000 feet seems important. 
we recommend the study to identify the amount of land that we brought would be brought under jurisdiction and the sensitivity sensitivity of that land. That was a VPA comment. Uh, we also uh, support VPA comments saying that uh, to revise the proposed language to retain the exemption for farming, logging, and forestry, even in critical resource areas. There are other and better ways to ensure that farming and forestry address environmental impacts. And then we would support an appeals process that can allows coordination and consolidation of appeals of municipal and state permits to one entity to ensure consistency in decision making and provide uh, unaligned requirements between the environmental court, which oversees enforcement and local zoning, and environmental review board, uh, which oversees appeals from district commissions and a &R permits. And that was the Chittenden County recommendation also. In summary, uh, proposed changes for Act 250 that are being considered are substantive. Given the expansion of land uses and, and the land areas that may fall under Act 250 jurisdiction, if these proposed changes are passed, it would seem to be prudent, um, in, in my eyes, to take any final version of the proposed changes back to the public through a well-noticed series of public hearings for comment before pass, being passed by the legislature and signed into law. It's extremely important to hear from local communities, landowners, and residents before enacting such significant changes. Um, thank you for your consideration. Thank you for uh, allowing me to take some of Dave's time and speak. Um, I was not on your schedule. I do not have things pre-filed with you, but I do have copies here for hopefully certainly enough for the committee, and then we'll see how many of the rest of them can go around. There you are. Thank you. Excuse me. Would it be possible to get an electronic version so we get it? Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. I will file them this afternoon. Examples that um, of, of well, supporting basically my testimony, and those are the things that are attached um, in the last couple of pages. Um, so let's see. The Addison County Regional Planning Commission. We serve 21 municipal members. We participate actively in the Act 250 process, the agency permits, um, and I'm offering my testimony from that perspective. Um, I would tell you this is a very idealistic bill, and that it seeks to use the 50th anniversary of Act 250 to create its own environmental legacy. And it does so, I would say, by proposing, and I would say, massive jurisdictional increases for state regulatory um, solutions to very broad but poorly defined areas. And I'm thinking slopes greater than 15% is a huge uh, section of Vermont. I assume elevations over 22,000 feet are, are also significant. Um, rural and working lands is a definition in this bill that is super broad. Um, so I look at these definitions and I think there are real challenges there. Um, it, it really expands the scope of Act 250 and it does it for climate change. Certainly climate change is an important um, issue facing Vermont, but um, I think we could be more, more targeted in that. Um, and uh, the jurisdictional expansion will affect economic development. Um, but I don't necessarily believe it will have significant impacts on climate change. I think there are other things that we can do um, that would, would do better. 
Um, similarly, the, the bill assumes that forests and rural countryside are facing significant de development pressure. Um, that's not necessarily my experience in Madison County, and I'm not sure if it's the experience of the large swaths of the state of Vermont. Um, just, I recognize you all did a, did a large report on uh, parcelization and, and forestry. Um, one of the things that I attached here is the 2018 current use program from the tax department. Um, and it, it actually shows that uh, enrollments in the current use program, so the, the chart on the first page, um, so the top line, the black line that goes up shows um, enrollments in the forest section of acres um, of forest land that are enrolled in current use, um, 2,498 acres as of 2018, 18,000 parcels. Um, so um, as you can see, that ownership has significantly increased over time. Um, the number of people participating, the number of parcels participating, and the number of uh, acres in the program are going up. All of those acres need to be managed for forestry. So they need to be managed for both forestry and um, and for uh, habitat connectivity and, uh, and natural resources impact. So I, uh, I'm using this as an example to show that I think this is a program that, that works for forest landowners, um, that provides economic opportunity for them um, in a managed way that also preserves the forest habitat connectivity and, um, and uh, the natural resources within those forests. Um, I would assert our land, working landscapes are, are, are struggling and they need support like this. Um, I agree that Act 250 and state planning regulations should work together, um, but this legislation largely does it under, under the auspices of, of state control. Um, we would much rather see the economic development programs tied to, to local planning and regional planning. Um, the next example I'm going to use is, is on the last page. It's a map of the town of Bristol. Um, actually, it's a map of only the village planning area of the town of Bristol. Um, and inside are zones. Um, so if you look at the big red blocks on the outside, the dots on the outside, um, that's the village planning area. And this is about one-tenth of the town of Bristol. You can see the ortho photo underneath, and you can kind of see the neighborhoods and things. The little candy cane um, dot in the center of the picture, so the very small area in the very center of the map, um, is Bristol's downtown designation. So it's around basically the main intersection of the town of Bristol, um, and it encompasses, I'll say, two, maybe three square blocks within the town of Bristol. Certainly not all the developed area. Um, but certainly the, the most developed area. It's, it's the commercial main street in Bristol. Um, this designation wasn't set up to en enhance economic development for broader purposes or for the purposes of, that we're looking to use it for um, under, under this legislation. It, uh, it does support grant programs um, for the town of Bristol, and Bristol certainly uses them, but it was designed intentionally very small, and it's really not going to do a lot to help other economic development areas and other areas where the town of Bristol, the village planning area, has, has said that they would like economic development. Um, if you layer on top of how small it is, um, all of the requirements that uh, this bill includes to have be an enhanced planning area, water and wastewater, um, and, and other requirements, it won't work for the town of Bristol. But they've done a very nice job in, in, in creating a village planning area uh, locally. Um, and they're doing a lot to, uh, to promote economic development within their compact village center. But it's, it's much bigger than, than, uh, than what would be provided for in these designated areas. Um, so uh, I use it as an example because I think um, 
the existing designation programs don't really work. They need to be, ex if you're going to use it for this purpose, they need, need to be expanded substantially. And, and I would argue you should look at, at the, the local planning areas, like the village planning area for the town of Bristol. Um, and in Addison County, all of the towns have plans. There might be a couple that are slightly out of date, but all of them have plans. All of them have local zoning. Um, 19 of 21 have subdivision regulations. Um, so I would urge you to uh, look at look at the local and regional plans, and rather than tying some, if you want to promote economic development in this in areas, um, tying it to the, uh, the existing planning areas, village planning areas that are that are out there, and uh, and work with the local communities and regions to do it. Um, that's the scope of my testimony. Let me see if I get this. Instead of what's in the draft bill about designated areas, you think that's not good. It's instead tied to existing planning areas. Yes, and to existing local plans. To existing I local would, planning areas. Yeah. Are, I, would, I would bet, at least in Addison County, most of the town plans have a, <coughs> and I, I'm not going to use a technical term, but it's a village planning area, it's a village district area, it's a place where they do encourage compact settlement. Um, they're all defined a little bit differently locally, and, and you might fix that. But, um, but How they're might generally, you fix that? Uh, just say every every town shall create a, um, I don't care if you want to call it a village or a city planning area around its existing um, most densely settlement areas for um, enhanced uh, economic development. But you can create a, a relatively simple definition of existing settlement that would that most towns already have plans that, that support that, so, um, rather than a, a, a relatively complex scheme of. Uh, and then earlier in your testimony, in the second paragraph of your letter, it said the state, however, expanding the jurisdiction to virtually every commercial development in the state, which would be the consequence of this bill, will neg negatively impact economic development have little impact on climate change, we can do better. What, what do you mean? So the, the reason I gave the current use program as an example of a program that it directly addresses forestry, um, forestry concerns and preserves natural resources, um, is a, I, I think, a positive step that, that promotes economic development in rural areas and, and basically protects natural resources and supports the working landscape. Um, if you look, some of the definitions in this bill are, are very, very broad, and I, I pointed to you know, slopes greater than 15%. Um, on what scale? You know, we have LIDAR that goes down to a foot at this point. But I'm wondering when you say we can do better. So I, I would say uh, supporting for the, the climate change. Program. We were just listening to a bunch of climate change on sure um, testimony. So I, I don't get we can do better. So you think I that think there are, on the local level you'll just do it or not do it? Or? I think if you gave the opportunity for people to basically um, use their, for towns, municipalities to use their existing um, settlements and the uh, planning areas that they have created in their town plans around their existing settlements as a place for enhanced um, planning and, and provided you know, uh, more funding for local planning and um, the infrastructure that's necessary to, to support that. I, I would say water and wastewater and, and broadband for our local villages. I think that would be a better solution to promote more economic development within our existing settlement areas than trying to marry this bill to um, the, the existing state designation programs that are complex and very small and very limited and probably won't work for most of the um, municipalities within the state. For example, in the bill, the requirement says to be an enhanced area, you would have to connect to water and wastewater. Well, in Addison County, that means towns with water and wastewater are Middlebury, Virgins, and to a lesser, lesser extent, Shoreham and Orwell. And None of the other 21 towns currently have water and wastewater. Bristol has a very, very small area. 
that's already sort of led, that, that's right in this designated downtown. Um, but nobody else would uh, be able to basically meet the enhanced, um, uh, what were you calling it, the, the criteria for the enhanced air, uh, local area, the enhanced local planning area. So by marrying it to all these, um, to the existing state designation programs and a number of other requirements, you are limiting that pool to a very, very tiny um, percentage of the state. So I think in the, in the Act 250 report um, that you issued this summer, it was one four hundredth of the state of Vermont. So 0.25% was covered by existing designation areas. Um, so pretty small um, area already. If you then add on the other limitations, like the requirement to have water, wastewater, zoning subdivision, etc., cetera, um, it becomes even smaller than a quarter of 1%. Um, so the, the trade-off, if you will, I don't believe exists if you tie it to those existing areas and require such, and, and tie it to a lot of stringent requirements. It just will never materialize in most towns in the state. Um, if you relax those requirements and acknowledge some of the local planning that's going on, um, like I said, I believe that if you looked at a map of the state and went to most towns, you would find a planning and zoning area around the existing, and I'll call it village, although I'm not using that term technically, or city center or whatever, um, that promoted more densely packed areas and, um, and was a product of the knowledge of the, the local planning process. Does that make sense? I understand what you said. Okay. Um, I'd like to know how this proposed legislation expands Act 250 jurisdiction to virtually every commercial shelf. Well, if you look at all the, this it, it contains a lot of definitions of that are that are very broadly written. So if um, I don't know what percent of, I haven't done a study as to what percent of uh, Vermont involves slopes of greater than 15%, and I don't know what, on what scale you're measuring 15%, but I imagine, knowing the topography of Vermont, that's a pretty, it's a pretty significant area. Similarly, greater than 2,000 feet is probably a relatively significant area, but I don't know how big it is. Um, working, uh, let's see. My testimony. Another area was uh, um, rural and working lands um, areas, and tying into that, I don't necessarily know what rural and working lands are, but I would assume that most places outside of these designation areas are rural and working lands. And if you're going to do a project of, of a size greater than an, than an acre, um, a commercial development greater than an acre, you would be in. So I would say it expands, given the definitions that are contained in the bill, it expands, it will expand Act 250 jurisdiction, or as I read it, I predict it would expand Act 250 jurisdiction to just about every commercial development outside of, right now, the small, very small designated areas that I've talked about. Without looking at it, you make that prediction? Um, no, with looking at it, after reading the bill, that's that's, that's hard. You didn't look at the land area above 2,000 feet or how many Well, I don't know. greater than 15%. You're right. I can't tell you precisely where all those areas are, but I can tell you that um, there are a lot of places in the state of Vermont are greater than that that would fall into this definition of working development. So, yes, I'm. That's my prediction reading the language in the book. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, thanks for coming in. Uh, both you and, uh, and David talked about your belief that it's better from the uh, plants are better when they develop at the bottom and percolate to the top. And I'm wondering, in terms of your regional plan, if you had gone through uh, the Department of Public Service in terms of that's looking now at regional plans to see if they are 
energy compliant with the state goals? And what kind of, I don't know, if you had any kind of, uh, what kind of feedback are you getting in terms of how heavy-handed or how basically complementary the Department of Public Service is in approving your plans? Uh, so to the best of my knowledge, they have approved every regional plan for an enhanced energy plan within the state of Vermont. So all of us have gone through the process and all of us have, have had basically plans approved that uh, do a number of things for, for energy, um, address climate change. Uh, Is that true when you do it? Yes, it is, and they've also given us the authority uh, with the approval of our regional plans to uh, certify local plans, and we've begun that process. We've done communities like Brighton. Uh, I think we're working with Peachin right now, but the, the, the department has essentially given us a checklist of what plans must contain, and we've kind of just certified that as we do our review, reviews. And to think that um, initially, uh, regional planning commissions were given uh, set aside funding to work with municipalities to come up with these enhanced energy plans, and that was for a two or three year period. Uh, but we're still seeing interest from um, communities coming forward. So the communities are thinking about climate change, and they are thinking about the, what efficiency and weatherization, uh, improving transportation systems and things like that. So um, yeah, that's what you're So is this a recognition that more or less regional and local plans are exhibiting a more higher, or higher level of sophistication in terms of taking into uh, these characteristics that the, the state now wants to see through Act 15? I would say yes. Representative Dolan. Still good morning, so. Um, I guess my question goes back to uh, the incentive that this draft bill was trying to establish mm -hmm. with these enhanced designations. Mm -hmm. It's only an, an incentive doesn't necessarily require communities to participate. Mm -hmm. But I guess I'm struggling with how to achieve um, a, an objective to create a set and, uh, and support settlement development with mixed use residential commercial that's that achieves the traditional settlement pattern focus that I think Vermont is so famous for without some sort of path forward, a direction forward in understanding how to achieve that kind of vision into the future. For example, um, when communities, and I'm in a rural district and we're constantly struggling with, um, with these issues and we recognize that our existing village designation was to accomplish separate goals, not necessarily aligned here. So, but the path forward is to try to think about how do we get to a position where we can keep our work, if I may use that term, working landscape working, um, to prevent that fragmentation of our agricultural land, even on the bands outside our, our historic villages, uh, without thinking about a path forward. And that path forward, in my mind, if you're going to try to um, encourage that kind of multi-use, pedestrian-friendly, bike-friendly um, um, settlement pattern. You you have to think about the steps. Obviously, you can't achieve that incentive right now because you might not have the infrastructure to allow that infill. We struggle with that in my towns because of um, wellheads around our drinking water and are right next to our septic systems that uh, you know we struggle with but um, so it's I don't think the this designation is to just carte blanche assume that we'll just um, uh, carte blanche uh, 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 allow for that type of existing de designation to meet the requirements but to provide a path forward so can you respond a little bit about that? Sure. So, so I applaud you for wanting to supply a path forward for towns to basically support the, the type of development in their downtown that we talked about. Um, what I'm suggesting is the path forward as outlined in this bill is so restrictive that it won't work in 80% of the towns in the state of Vermont, maybe more. Um, 
if you want to provide that path forward, you need to, the path needs to be um, easier for the towns to get to. So um, the reason I, sho I showed you Bristol, um, you can the ortho photo, photo behind it, and it's 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 a busy map. Um, but you can see basically the, the planning area of Bristol, and it's actually it's just the village planning area. If I were to blow up the town of Bristol, um, the, the town of Bristol would be about ten times bigger than this. The village planning area is is only about a tenth of the town, and you can see the neighborhoods and you can see some of the mixed use areas beyond it. The designation is just the little candy cane. Um, Creating a path for just that little candy cane doesn't necessarily help the village of Bristol develop in the way that we, you know you were talking about and we were talking about um, because that's the place that already has the most development. There's not a lot of opportunity there, but in the village planning area, the bigger area, there's there's a there is opportunity, and Bristol's doing some really good things to try and promote some commercial development downtown. Um, you know, the Stony Hill development is one of them. The, the rebirth of uh, Bristol Works is, is one thing. It's got some really good uh, downtown stories, but it will never meet the path as laid out in um, in this legislation. And, and I think that's a shame. I think that if you're trying to lay out a path to encourage municipalities to to build compact centers and offer them an incentive for uh, for economic development, then, then most of them um, should be able to to meet that those that path. Most of them should have the resources and the ability to do it. So I'm asking you in my testimony to think about the path that you've laid out and make it um, a little more town friendly um, and a little bit more focused on the planning that the towns have already done because most of them do have planning areas and supported by zoning for smaller, denser commercial, commercial areas. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Um, yes, Representative um, That would be great. Welcome. Hi. Uh, we're, we're here on Karen Lafayette. Uh, uh, Vermont to Coalition for Disability Rights. This is our Disability Awareness Day. And I brought Nate Bazile with me today. He works at the Vermont Center for Independent Living. And he was going to comment on your H74, which is the plastic bans and the restriction on plastic straws that um, a, a lot of folks with disabilities make use of. So um, I'm here because sometimes he has a hard time hearing, so I, I may just so speak loud and um, I, can, I can get it to him if you can yeah, turn our also, coffee pot yeah, off. Let's turn the coffee pot off because that's loud. Push it up. I, I should be able to hear okay in this room. That's good. There's not much background. Yeah, that's much better. Thank you. Um, yeah. and, well, I just want to give you a quick update, which is this is one of our priorities, but I believe we're getting a bill from the Senate um, that will be similar, that we will, if we get it, we'll take that up. Um, at crossover. So we haven't taken any testimony on this at all, but I understand that you're in the building today and would like to give us your thoughts on it. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so thank you very much for hearing my testimony. Uh, so for the record, I have just the cold state your name. Oh, uh, my name is Nathan Bazayo. I work for the Vermont Center for Independent Living uh, in our Burlington office. So I live in Colchester, and I am a free joint on uh, the downtown area in Burlington. And uh, I just wanted to make you know my comments on uh, the bill H74. Uh, I, I think this is an important bill. I understand the need for uh, environmental safety and environmental conservation. Uh, I just want to make sure that, and we at BCIL will make sure that the disabled community is involved in the decision process and that it is known what a, an important tool that straws are for people with disabilities. Uh, for a lot of people with disabilities, using a straw isn't a matter of convenience. It's actually just the only way they can drink or eat or take their medications. And, for a lot of cases, having that straw available when they go into a restaurant is um, helping them be independent. Um, to ask people with disabilities to provide their own straws uh, is a step for a lot of cases that adds a lot more complexity to what they need to do. A person with a disability might not be able to get the straw themselves. So they might end up having to ask a wait step, can you get the straw for me, which 
they might say no underneath the ADA because that changes the ground for what they work. They might think that's too much for a reasonable accommodation. Many people, um, some of the straws don't work as well as plastic straws. So it is a concern that we want to make sure it's addressed. And I do see it is addressed in um, Part B of the bill, which says no food or service establishment shall sell or provide a single use plastic straw to a customer except upon request of a person with uh, a medical or medical straw due to disability or medical conditions. And that's a good addition, but we just want to make sure that, you know, people who ask for the straw aren't being asked to disclose too much. Whether, you know, you might have people with kidney disabilities who, you know, are these people going to say, customers going to say, what's your disability? Well, that's illegal. You can't ask that under the American with Disabilities Act. So we understand the question. We understand businesses holding straws and making them available upon request, but we want to make sure that it does not infringe on the rights of people with disabilities when they request them. Um, and also making sure that restaurants still have these straws available. If straws don't, if a lot of people are using the straws, our restaurants are not going to supply the straws, and therefore that takes away another um, livelihood for people with disabilities. So it is great law. I think it's really workable, but we do want to make sure that people with disabilities give their feedback and make something that can work that can benefit everybody. Great. Does anyone have any questions? Representative yeah. Fordegs. Uh, how would you consider paper straws as opposed to plastic straws? Well, so there's a couple of issues with paper straws. I don't know if everybody's had them, but... I mean, I had, I had them when I grew up, but that's yeah, not... Yeah. So, for example, coffee. Coffee's a great example. Sometimes I like to have a hot cup of coffee. Paper straws do not do well with coffee. They basically dissolve upon contact with coffee. So um, a lot of times they collapse. Uh, a lot of times people might need the higher integrity of a straw. You might have somebody who might bite, who might have jaw issues, could bite clear through a paper straw. So I do think in certain, certain conditions, paper straws are great, but they aren't really made for hot drinks. That's my experience. They tend to dissolve with the country. So, um, depending on what they drink, paper straws could be a great alternative. But um, it is. And I don't want it to be easy that I'm speaking universally for all people using straws because I only have one type of disability. There's people with all types of different disabilities. Um, universally, plastic straws have been supposed to use for straws. I'm sure there's reasons. Um, but I'm sure in certain, certain circumstances, paper straws can be, be a good, good alternative. Do people ever use uh, metal straws, like stainless steel or some reusable type straws? Yes, um, there are certainly people out there who use them. A couple of the issues with metal straws are, number one, they're hard to clean. So you have to basically, a lot of times if you don't have paint, you literally have to use a pipe cleaner yeah. And, yeah. and push it inside. Yeah. And again, you might have people with, um, some people with CP, for example, might have spasmic biting issues, and that could break their teeth. Yeah. So, I actually, um, I, I just in case, I carry around silicone straws in my backpack just in case of situations. But again, if I go to a business and I say, can you get my straw, can you dig through my backpack? Yeah. A lot of times they'll kind of go, eh. And then sometimes my might the case where I, I use a straw, I put it in my backpack and I forget it for about a month and it starts to like sprawl on the backpack. And it's totally much yeah. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of cases for that. But I just heard that before, you know, what, yeah. what about metal straws? Yeah, and again, for a lot of people, metal straws are okay, but then it also, you know, we go back to hot drinks. Uh, metals conduct heat, yeah. and so you might just leave a cup of coffee, and that heat will conduct through the metal. Yeah. Uh, Representative McCullough yeah. and Odie. Nate, you, you, you mentioned the problem with drinking hot coffee. Or, yeah. And, and I haven't seen the bill. My apologies, but... Is there, maybe the bill says, but if not, would your recommendation be to actually, as as part of the bill, where it says, you know, you, you can't do straws except for, um, and and then then specify. You mentioned a silicone um, straw. Is there is there a type of straw or brand of straw, we can't use brands generally speaking, but that you would recommend that are good for hot or cold 
Well, like I said, and again, I'm speaking about my case, and again, also by me. My case, I found that silicone straws work the best for different temperatures. Yeah. But the problem with silicone straws a lot is they're not very pliable. They're not very bendable. Yeah. So you can either one that's a straight line or you can have one that's a cop. So <coughs> if I had to say one, um, you know, silicone is the best. They're also the most expensive. Yeah. So silicone options are also the most expensive type of straws out there. Yeah. So, you know, um, if I was in plus our, you know, all the business is going to take the straws and, and clean the straws and make available, that, that would be the, if there was a straw, I would recommend using it in silicone. But again, you also have a population of people who um, don't have much in terms of disposable income who are being asked. I think a pack of four or five straws, silicone straws, can cost anywhere between six and ten dollars. They're not single use. And so the question would be, is there a single use straw that that can do hot or cold that that a restaurant could have on hand to satisfy the need? Um, again, uh, to my knowledge, no. I mean, plastic straws are basically the ones that are clear about every other kind of material. It has some kind of you know material to it. It's, 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 a basic plastic straw could could suffice yeah. for a hot cup. In my experience, yes. So when I go to places, I have plastic straws and they, they were good. Good. You know, there are certain places that I go that have the um, the biodegradable straws. Um, so I know, like uh, in my area, I think Healthy Living has it. So if I use that halfway through the drink, the straws is gone. Uh, <laughs> not, it's, not good. Uh, and you've been uh, drinking uh, it. Yeah. yeah. My questions were asked and answered. Okay. Great. Um, I'm wondering if you've looked at other aspects of the bill in terms of, from your perspective, like. I don't know if there's something else we haven't caught in terms of plastic bags or those other items. Um, you know, I think in terms of that, even in terms of plastic bags, I haven't really thought about it anymore. From what I've been hearing in my feedback has dealt with more the the fact that, you know, we need to eat, we need to drink, so the straws. I think in the case of the bags, you know, asking somebody to bring their bags so as a disability could be an issue because a lot of people who um, who are mobile or have mobility issues might not be able to bring all those bags with them and bring them back with empty bags with them. Um, so I mean, it, it's it's a it's a it's a tricky wicket. I mean, it's really a tricky wicket. You try to do some help for the environment, but you also want to make sure people are meeting their needs. Um, certainly, you know, in that aspect, you know, I am I actually for my decisions kind of easy. I mean, I'm 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 gonna mobile moving cart for crying out loud. Like, my wife actually hangs the groceries on the back of my chair because I'm like her, I'm like her you all. So for that case, um, you know, canvas bags work. But there's always going to be a situation where somebody might need something different. Um, and I think if you're asking certain people with disabilities, um, again, income comes into it with a limited amount of money to produce their own bags and have their own bags with them. It, it could be an issue. Honestly, I haven't really thought too much about that part, though. Uh, you know, Thank you so much for coming in. Is it, well, I guess I should say, is there anything else you want to share with your committee your no. on no, thank, thank, thank you. 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 Thank you.
Well, so Richard Cower, Regulatory Assistance Project. Um, I should start by, by saying that this is one of my favorite places in the world to be. Uh, we, we work all over the world, and there's no, really, I mean this quite sincerely, no better place than the Vermont legislature. Um, I have always appreciated the work that is done in this building. I was chair of the Public Service Board for 12 years. Okay, let's try to bring our meeting to order. <laughs> it seems to be a little chaos. You realize the most recent version, whose name we can find it under, I know there's Frederick Weston, but there's also Richard Coward up here on our list. So which one should we use? Richard Coward. Okay, He's thank you. Middle. We'll use that version and hopefully it'll get somewhere. You can click on it and then we can follow on. Let's see if it goes up. One of you it's not, it's not, it wasn't going in earlier. No, mine worked. I just hit Richard Coward. Oh. So, right. Do you not have an iPad? Yeah, I think you would just touch your name and then have a look. Oh, maybe. Refresh. You could refresh. Oh, refresh. That little arrowy thing on the top. members of the committee. Uh, my name is Richard Coward. I'm a principal with the Regulatory Assistance Project, RAP. And my colleagues with me today are Frederick Weston um, and David Farnsworth. We are here because we were asked by the JFO to conduct a, a quick study and a review of a study that had been commissioned by JFO by Resources for the Future. And I don't know if they presented to you. They have. Yes. Okay. So we were asked to um, take a look at that study and to complement that study. And um, that's what we've done. And I guess I should pause for a moment and ask you would you like us to introduce ourselves? Sure. That would be good for the record. Well, so Richard Cower, Regulatory Assistance Project. Um, I should start by, by saying that this is one of my favorite places in the world to be. Uh, we, we work all over the world, and there's no, really, I mean this quite sincerely, no better place than the Vermont legislature. Um, I have always appreciated the work that is done in this building. I was chair of the Public Service Board for 12 years. Uh, I've been at RAP now for 20 years. Um, the last 10 years or so, I've been setting up a program and working in Europe on a lot of the same topics that we're talking about today. And um, for eight years, I was chair of the Electricity Advisory Committee of the U.S. Department of Energy during the Obama administration. So I've worked in the U.S. as well. So. Um, and I'll ask my colleagues to say a couple words. Uh, Rick Weston, also with the Regulatory Assistance Project uh, for the last nearly 20 years as well. And before that, was a, I've been a uh, hearing officer and economist with the Public Service Board. For the last eight years or so, I've been running uh, our China program. And I'm no longer doing that, so I'm, I'm, I'm here, which is great. I'm Chairman Dave Farnsworth. I'm an associate with the Regulatory Assistance Project. I was a staff attorney and hearing officer at the Utility Commission, Public Service Board at the time, for about 14 years, and I've been at RAP for about 10 years. And we provide technical and policy assistance to regulators and legislators and others. So we're all, if you're multiply busy uh, people, as you all are, and I should also let you know that. I've been associated with Vermont uh, Energy Investment Corporation, BEIC, for a long time, and presently serve as chair of the board of BEIC. So, let's get going. As I said, we're here because JFO uh, asked us to take a look at the RFF study. And in addition to taking a look at it, we 
have uh, engaged two other expert groups, Energy Futures Group uh, from Heinsberg, Vermont, and a <coughs> consulting firm that specializes in uh, low carbon transportation, MJ Bradley Associates. So we're giving you the analysis is based on all of their work and our work. And I'm just going to begin with an observation that you know the topic of the day is carbon pricing. You were asked to, uh, the legislature asked RFF to look at um, the idea of carbon pricing as a way to drive down global warming emissions. And uh, and they came in and they did a big model and looked at what carbon pricing could do and couldn't do. And one of the conclusions, and I'm just going to lead you one to our main conclusion. Our main conclusion today is that carbon pricing alone is not going to be sufficient. Uh, it will cost more and deliver less than a set of Vermont-based low-carbon programs, principally focused on energy efficiency and electrification, that will be um, far more successful and cost less than relying on carbon pricing alone. That's our basic conclusion. And I should say that's, that's not inconsistent with what they said. Uh, they acknowledge that as well. If uh, the chart on the wall right now is uh, something that you may have seen um, a few times before, I don't know. But it's an assessment of, of by the McKinsey firm using a technique they use to look at how much it costs to reduce a ton of carbon um, and how many tons could be reduced through different techniques. And the um, those beginning on the left hand side are techniques, mostly their energy efficiency, and you don't really need to study the details, uh, that actually save money. So these are ways that, that we can reduce carbon emissions and save money at the same time. And, um, and so the interesting question is, if those things already save money, why aren't they being done? We have learned over the years that there are lots of barriers to low cost to delivering low-cost energy efficiency, and that's why we have programs uh, that aim to do that. And the reason I'm putting this up here is to sort of make the point that pricing alone it is already proven not to be the, the, the technique that by itself would deliver uh, either low-cost energy efficiency or um, carbon savings. In the next slide, I'm showing you the results of a study that we did in this particular study was in the United Kingdom. And it was done by one of our colleagues who was uh, had run energy efficiency programs in the UK. And so it's based on real data. And the question there is, the question asked is, could a carbon price in the UK uh, by itself reduce emissions? Or should some other programs be used in order to perhaps be more effective. And what you see here on the, the little blue wedge at the bottom of this chart shows the conservation that would result if you raised prices on natural gas in the UK by 3%. It, it doesn't really matter what, what percent we're talking about. These ratios remain roughly the same. And what you get is you get some price response, but you don't get very much conservation because people hate their homes and the 3% price rise doesn't make much difference, they don't do much. And so we then asked the question, well, what if you took the revenue associated with that 3% cost, just took the money and invested it in a well-designed efficiency program? In the UK, they did this. They took, the, they took an amount of money um, by, by doing what we do in Vermont, actually, which is putting an obligation on regulated utilities. Um, and they they ran a water heater, I'm sorry, natural gas boiler replacement program, which in the UK is the main way people heat water and heat their homes. So they ran a program 
to help homeowners improve the efficiency of their furnaces. And the consequence is that the amount of savings in energy savings, dollar savings, and carbon savings is shown in the area underneath the red one. The red one. So they ended up saving nine times more money, carbon, and gas through a program than they would have saved just by raising rates. And that's a lesson that we know in Vermont. We have succeeded over the years with efficiency first uh, thinking in Vermont for quite some time. And uh, as you know, through Section 248 standards uh, that the PUC uses, energy efficiency dockets, efficiency Vermont, the Vermont gas programs, et cetera. We've been saving energy now for 25 years through programs. We spend <coughs> about 7% of total power system revenues on efficiency, compared with over 90%, of course, on supply and delivery. Um, and what's interesting about that is that the savings build up over time. And efficiency is now supplying, or displacing, if you want to use, look at it the other way, about 20% of the total electricity demand in our state. Demand would have been 20% higher today than it is without those programs. So even though it's a relatively small fraction of uh, spending, because the savings grow over time, it has become a very big part of our power mix, and um, it has generated well over $2 billion in electric energy savings for Vermont customers. We've learned on the electricity side and in natural gas that these programs uh, really work, they really save people money, um, they lower our demand, and um, Vermont is known around the world, frankly, for doing that. But I woke up recently realizing, oh, that's nice, we do that. But I, I put this slide together now for the hard part. Um, our emissions aren't any longer coming from electricity. Our emissions are coming from two main sources, transportation and home heating, or the heating of buildings generally. And it, we need to turn our attention from just thinking about the regulated utilities and think now about how are we going to save energy through efficiency in uh, transportation and buildings. So it's it's not doing away with what we used to do. We need to keep we still need to keep okay. doing that. But it's adding a focus on buildings and transportation. Why should we do this? You know, maybe you all you know, that you're totally aware of this fact, but I, I keep being surprised every time I look at it. That we are spending two billion dollars a year to import carbon that we don't actually even want to burn. We have a we have a statewide goal to reduce those emissions by eighty or ninety percent. And here we are spending two billion dollars a year to buy it and bring it into our state instead of doing things inside our state that would lower that bill. That's equivalent, by the way, to two times the size of the Vermont agricultural economy altogether. And the total income of 35,000 uh, median Vermont households. Now, that's a big bill. How can we spend less and save more? Here I want to get to the question that I'm now going to, I'm just getting ready to turn this over to my colleagues, that I, uh, in this slide called carbon efficiency. And this is because a lot of the discussion around carbon focuses on what is the carbon price. Economists love to talk about the carbon price. As a bill payer, I like to, I like to answer the question, how much is it going to cost per ton? to avoid a ton of carbon in our economy. So the questions that I would urge you to ask about programs to reduce emissions, how many tons will it save? How fast will it work? 
and how much will it cost the public per ton of oil? Alongside that, we need to recognize that the, whatever we do, it needs to be fair and inclusive to everyone and look for ways to advance, um, ways to serve the uh, working Vermonters, working families, and the vulnerable populations alongside the goal of uh, carbon reduction. So, now I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues. As I said <coughs> in the beginning, we commissioned two studies, one on transportation and one on housing. And Dave's going to talk about transportation. Thank you. Uh, folks, I'm just going to take the next several slides just to explain to you a little bit about um, MJ Bradley's analysis of the transportation questions we put before them and um, to explain how they approached uh, the question and just give you um, what I think are uh, important um, takeaways from, from this study. First, what they did was look at two scenarios, one a business as usual scenario and the other an 80% reduction by 2050 scenario. The, the business as usual scenario has um, no change to um, US CAFE standards, that's fleet efficiency standards, federal fleet efficiency standards. Uh, no policies to promote renewable fuels, uh, transportation fuels, and uh, relatively low levels of EV adoption. That's the business as usual approach. And what they modeled as uh, steps for Vermont to take uh, involved doing something about cafe standards, uh, increasing those standards, increasing the use of uh, renewable fuels, and electrifying um, electrifying transportation. <laughs> Basically, what you have up there are the um, are the uh, are these specific um, strategies broken out. What they originally did for us, and we asked them to take a second look at, was to take a look at all the transportation sector and what it would cost to decarbonize it by 2030 and 2050. When you look at all of the transportation sector, you're looking at um, a Nissan Sentra and you're looking at a semi-truck and you're putting it all together for one sort of analysis under a model and that just, we didn't find that particularly helpful. We asked them to break it out to light duty, medium duty, and heavy duty. And what we found um, was very interesting news with respect to light duty vehicles, okay? They still had the average. So there's an average car they're looking at, and that average car looks like an F-150. It looks like a medium-sized uh, SUV. It looks like a, a mid-sized um, automobile and a small automobile. It's all glommed together. So that's the way modeling works. I can't help you with it much more than that. But the good news about um, light-duty vehicles is that with some support, Vermont can get on a path to electrifying transportation with respect to that slice of the transportation sector. We think that's really important. Uh, as far as the specific uh, figures go, Rich talked about what is, what is the price per ton avoided, because we think that's a really good way of measuring what otherwise would be apples and oranges. Okay. Um, and what you see when you, um, when you look at that with respect to light duty EVs, for $16 a metric ton avoided, Vermont over the next 10 years, at least up to 2030, can basically change the market, transform the market. And that means you, Vermont can step in with some supports to make up the difference between the price of a conventional light duty vehicle and an electric one, uh, provide supports. But after 10 years, they can almost completely step away. So for about $7 million a year between now and 2030, they could, uh, this modeling demonstrates that that change could take place. It ends up to be at about um, two cents a gallon gas. When you look at medium duty on the other hand and heavy duty, there's a big challenge there. The model assumes people drive 12,000 miles a year, okay? 1,000 miles a month. Well, if you have a $10,000 car, a $20,000 car, you can do the arithmetic, but if you have a car that's much bigger, or a truck that's much bigger with much greater power needs, much bigger batteries, then the price goes way up. And if you're still driving 12,000 miles a year, it's just not going to pencil out. So there's some big numbers 
cause you a little whiplash when you look at the medium duty and heavy duty. But the light duty, um, the news about light duty vehicles, it's uh, it's a very it's very positive news, and we're really encouraged by it. I guess I'll leave you with that and have Rick take it. We also looked at the buildings or heating sector. Uh, as as with the transportation in the heating sector, we identified a number of <coughs> programmatic actions that we thought would be of high value. Uh, chances are that they would have significant reductions uh, in uh, carbon. Uh, but we didn't do a full-fledged, what are the best programs that you can possibly imagine uh, sort of analysis. Uh, we took a look at five programs. You see them here. Uh, Low-income weatherization, residential. Non-low-income weatherization. Uh, retrofitting boilers and furnaces with uh, uh, cold climate heat pumps. And then retrofitting as well uh, water heaters, domestic water heaters. And the last program we looked at uh, is uh, replacing school boilers with wood pellet fired boilers. And you can see, roughly, we looked at uh, the the object was to get about roughly anywhere from 40 to 50 percent of the eligible market in the next 10 years. So this is a menu of programs. The heating programs, uh, here you see the costs and benefits. Uh, these were all in um, the, the present value to $2,018, and that was true as well of the transportation numbers. Uh, by way of comparison, the RFF report looked at $2,015. but. You know, they're roughly comparable. A couple years of discounting that you want to keep in mind. We took a look at these programs from two perspectives. One is what we call the total cost perspective, uh, and that is the cost of the program plus any of the costs that the participants in the program would pay. So if I'm getting my house weatherized, the program pays for part of it, uh, and I pay for part of it. In the, non, in the low income program, the weatherization, it's paid for entirely by uh, the program. The other three ones, there's a sharing. So that's the total cost perspective. The program cost perspective is, of course, the public dollars that we would be talking about that would support the program. And what we found, again, going after 50% of the eligible, eligible market in 10 years, which is quite aggressive, uh, we found that these programs save money straight up. They are economically efficient, they are cost effective. These are things that you want to do because they save Vermonters money from the get-go before you even think about the carbon benefits. So these, as you can see, there are some significant numbers here. These are millions of dollars in 2018 dollars. Um, and the benefit cost ratios are, as you can see from the various perspectives, are all uh, well over one. When you take a look at them, from the perspective of the tons of carbon that they avoid, this sheet will give you an idea, this, this uh, table will give you an idea. On the left are the tons of carbon that these programs will avoid. And on the right is the program cost. The far right is the, um, the program cost per ton that you avoid. And because these are all cost-effective programs from an economic perspective, you get the carbon savings for free. So if your object is to get carbon, you want, these, these are lower than low cost carbon savings. These are negative cost carbon savings. Go, the, the slide that Rich showed at the beginning, that cost curve that ran from lower left to upper right, all those things on the left hand side of that curve were programs that you can do to save carbon that are economically beneficial so they, you get the carbon for free. And that's true of, of the heating programs that we looked at uh, for, this, for the purposes of this study. Yeah, go. Yeah. Um, now, just, oh, sure. Representative um, I got to, I just got to say, I'm horrible with, with tables like this. And, and if you would just walk me through, let's take the biofuels wood pellet. Uh, because he's those are pretty simple numbers and it's simple as pests for me. Um, so uh, in the total cost perspective, we've got 20 million, I'm thinking. Is that yeah, correct? Uh, in current dollars? Uh, yes, 20 million of costs. Of costs, right. And 46 million in benefits. In benefits. That's correct. 
Um, and it's total benefits. That's the avoid. Those are the costs that are avoided by doing this thing. So what you're doing is you've got a wood pellet boiler instead of an oil fire furnace. Primarily what you're saving in that $46 million is the cost of oil. Okay? You are also avoiding some replacement capital costs if you kept your furnace you know, down the road, 10 years down the road, or five years down the road, or 15, you'd have to make you have to replace it. Okay, so that's those, the value of avoiding capital replacement is there too, but it's primarily avoiding fossil fuel costs. And so, and then we have $26 million net um, that's the net. of savings. Right. And zooming all the way over to the far right, um, well, I guess the uh, current net benefit's not quite far right. That's thirty million dollars. It costs us thirty million dollars to get the twenty-six million net. Is that what that means? No. Um, Where are you? There? He's, he's on the bottom. He's, he's, bottom he's, he's, line. At, he's at the thirty million. Uh, again, the two perspectives. The total cost perspective. I just want to make sure we've got the total cost perspective includes that NPV of costs, the twenty million. Yep. Includes the costs that the program pays and the participants pay. So there would be some sharing from the school, primarily in fuel costs, but maybe some capital costs as well. On the right side, we're only looking at what the program puts into it. So that $16 million is, is, the, uh, is what the program would pay for, okay. which, which means, if you subtract one from the other, the sharing by the participants is $4 million, okay? That's what but the benefits, the total benefits, are still forty-six million dollars from a program, from a public dollars perspective. We spent sixteen million, and we get forty-six million back and thirty in net. And this is for this will get about ninety schools um, over okay. ten years, out of an eligible market of about one hundred eighty. Net benefit from the program. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Thank you Great. very much. Representative Dolan. And, and, really and what's what discount rate? Oh, this, oh, um, they were using three real. Well, that's the 3% real, and of course, inflation is not good. Okay, thank you. Okay, so just back to this one, and finally, is again, these are negative, negative costs per ton of carbon. Okay, uh, now I just wanted to summarize that. Uh, this is I, the, uh, the truck that you and I just looked at a moment ago. I took all five of the programs and added them up. And if you were to do all of the programs, if you even wanted to do all of the programs, and of course you can do all, none, parts of them or whatever, but on our analysis, if you were to do them all, this is what it would look like. Um, 786, uh, excuse me, $524 million of public investment for $954 of gross savings, uh, a benefit cost ratio of 1.82. Again, that's aggregated, just, just to give you an idea of the magnitude of, um, of the potential savings. So roughly saving on $1.80 for every dollar you spend. Oh, oh, sorry, my fault. Okay, so now just a couple of wrap-up conclusions from us. Um, we, we begin this work with a real sense of urgency about climate. And I'm also motivated um, as a former utility commissioner who really cared about what Vermonters have to pay. I'm highly motivated by um, the fact that we are sending so much money out of our state to buy fuels that we could um, keep at home through by being more efficient. And we know how to do this. Um, and I'm going to start with, so sometimes legislators ask me, well, all right, I know we can't do everything, but what could we do that would really be the best way to start? And I, I would say, in addition to the programs that Vermont already has in place, which are some strong energy efficiency programs, by utilities and efficiency Vermont and Vermont Gas, we have the weatherization assistance program that is cost-effectively <coughs> assisting uh, low-income households to live in healthier and less expensive homes. And 
um, I would start by encouraging first that we at least double the size of that program. There are something like 50,000 eligible housing units um, that are in need of treatment and are eligible for treatment under this program. And we've been serving less than 1,000 a year. Um, at that rate, we are, we'll never get the, house, the low income housing stock renovated to healthy and efficient standards. Uh, we could easily do much better. Um, we have a question for you. Um, how much does the in, uh, the weatherization program <coughs> rely on federal funding, and how much is their state funds? The, currently, 80% of our program is state funded. We only get 20%. And that tells you something about how weak the federal program has yeah. gotten over the years. Mm -hmm. If it weren't for the state program, our program would be incredibly so. Um, now, my second small bullet there has to do with how we pay for programs. We, we should just face the fact that over the years we have been successful in uh, raising money through the regulated utilities to invest in energy efficiency. And as I said at the very beginning, We've saved well over $2 billion by doing that. But we have not been successful in attacking the thermal side, the liquid fuels side, the delivered fuels, however you want to refer to that category of fuels. We have, just haven't done it. We have a very small contribution to the weatherization program. We're spending uh, a few, um, We've tried to attack thermal in a couple of other creative ways, uh, but for the most part, you know, we should just face the facts here that we are underinvesting in thermal efficiency, and thermal um, fuels contribute far less proportionately to energy efficiency than electricity and natural gas contribute. Um, they're just not on a level playing field at all. I think the rate for electricity is something like 10 times higher than the rate of revenue we're getting from fossil fuels. Um, as I say here, um, thermal efficiency in housing is a priority, and we have programs in place today that we can build on um, to, to continue those programs and to make them stronger. Um, advanced wood heat in Vermont schools, I, personally no, think it's a terrific idea. It's good for Vermont's um, forestry resource and forestry business, and it uh, saves money for the schools and keeps the money in Vermont. On the transportation side, uh, we recommend that, that the legislature um, stick to the resolution that you've already enacted, encouraging a strong regional Transportation Climate Initiative. That program is starting now and deserves your continued support. And it would be a good thing to, um, to launch a program for, uh, to improve access to low emitting vehicles for working and low income families that are currently being, um, when they are assisted in the transportation area, they're being historically assisted to buy very low efficiency, uh, relatively high cost vehicles. And I'll close with this. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, what is not here is, one thing that's not here but is in our report is the final table that compares the relative costs of these programs in a way that we thought might be helpful to you. Rich has emphasized when you're thinking about carbon efficiency, the price, the cost per ton avoided matters. And the lower the cost per ton avoided, that's why I like, that's why I like doing the, uh, the buildings part of this, because I get to say negative cost per ton, and I feel good about that. But um, that really matters. Uh, there's a, a slide that we, we don't have here, uh, operator malfunction, um, that compares the 
average cost per ton avoided by the buildings programs that we, or the heating programs that we described, that's about $141 negative on a program cost basis, public dollar basis. Uh, the uh, transportation light duty vehicles, as David said, about $16 a ton avoided uh, from that program. And past 2030, those numbers go negative again because EVs are more than comparable with, uh, light duty EVs are more than comparable with, with uh, traditional cars. Last, lastly, the, the RFF report gave you four price paths for carbon on a pricing only basis. If you were to price it, here's, what, here's what's going to happen. The lowest price path trajectory that they gave you uh, for the horizon that they were looking at is something that they call the WCI, uh, the Western Climate Initiative Expected Price Path. That would produce savings per ton at a cost of, if they fall, Ton, uh, savings at a cost per ton of over $400. So you see there's a huge difference. And the only other thing I would add to that is the, the sum of the programs, the sum of the costs of the, the, of the programs that we've looked at. And again, they are illustrative. These are not deeply, I mean, they're well-designed, but they're, if you were to do them, you'd want to be putting a lot of work into uh, program design and delivery and, and all that. and really. You know, sharpening pencils on that, but uh, the, the public dollar costs of the programs as, as we looked at them are significantly below the total cost of a price path under the, of the lowest cost price path that RFF even began to talk about, just to give you an idea of the orders of magnitude here, and, and we show those numbers in our, in our report. Thank you. Thanks for your patience. We're excited to answer questions. Early on in the presentation, there was a figure of cost of two dollars per something, and I don't remember what that two dollars per something was. All right. You said two cents. No. Here we go. Not remembering two dollars per set, two billion dollars. I remember. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking that that oh. was two dollars per gallon. Oh, oh, two cents per gallon of gasoline. I thought it was two dollars, but maybe it, maybe it was a dollar sign for point two, yeah. point zero two. Yeah, I, I actually you mentioned anyway, two cents. Yeah, two cents a gallon. Okay, would give you the 70 million dollars between now and 2030 that would support that market transformation for light duty vehicles that I described as the I think the best takeaway from the MJ Bradley analysis. Now I've got, a, 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 just, can I ask one more sure. question? Um, and this may not be an area that, you know, that you're associated with. I was at a, <coughs> a state budget appropriations hearing in Springfield Monday night and it was all people with asks and one of the asks was for a, a person who is extracting limestone from the atmosphere to save on carbon. Is that anything that you would want to comment on? <laughs> uh, well, there's, there's a Swedish company, excuse me, a Swiss company is trying to do this as well. Just read about. I, I have, the question you ask is: is how many, how much is it going to cost per ton of carbon dioxide that you get out of the atmosphere? And, th and they can answer that question if you put it to them. And I think you'll find it's pretty expensive. I suspect. Yeah. I, well, I suspect the same thing. <laughs> yeah. I hadn't heard of that one before. The various carbon capture and sequestration um, technologies uh, so far have all proven to be. More expensive than people want to pay, and I, you know, and I just go back to, you know, that my, I guess almost my very first slide, this one. I just go back to here and say, why are we beating ourselves up on the right hand side of this slide when we have so much to do in on the left hand side that saves money 
uh, for Vermonters while, while we go about it. Representative Modi. So the two cents a gallon on gas gives us money for going to electric vehicles. So I have a question about that. And then for efficiency, building efficiency, where do we get that money? So, you know, we're in the, we're in the right building to say, it's your choice, of course. Uh, but if, if the, I was trying to be really straight with you about the disproportionate um, way that we fund efficiency in Vermont today. And the, we have historically avoided raising money for efficiency on delivered fuels. And one of the best ways that we could you know, take a step would be to uh, do better on that side. And you're thinking that there's an equitable argument there because if you're getting, if you're using gas or electricity, you, what, what yeah, yes. if, we're, if we have natural gas, we're paying it, we have propane, we're paying it? No. no. If you're paying it on what? So, Anything regulated. So the regulated fuels, electricity and natural gas, and this is because of initiatives begun by the regulators a long time ago um, and maintained for 25 years since. Um, we knew, the regulators knew, and I am such a person, <laughs> we knew that it was better for ratepayers to spend money on efficiency than it would be to spend money on power plants and transmission lines and buying fuel and all that. Mm -hmm. And because those programs were proven to be cost effective, we created energy efficiency programs for the regulated utilities, electricity and natural gas. The unregulated fuel suppliers have been, for the most part, not participating in, by, in supporting or paying for those programs. And therefore, thermal savings in Vermont have been left not entirely behind because we have some thermal programs, but uh, they have been under supported. So I would rec I would recommend I do recommend that you take a hard look at that and consider uh, a, a charge on delivered fuels that's somewhat closer to what we're spending on, on electricity and gas for the purpose of giving it back to customers in the form of energy efficiency. And at a minimum, you can do this, for, in my opinion, I urge, I'd urge you to think hard about doing it for low-income housing. Uh, but if you do it for low-income housing, does that mean where people are renting? Because if they're renting, then you're giving it to landlords. How that program works is something you should ask the weather efficient, oh. weather efficient assistance program. Um, that mostly in those rental units, it's the tenants who are paying the bills. So you're actually benefiting the tenants when you lower the, the heating so load. As this relates to Act 250, what would your recommendation be? That we should go with the enhanced building now? So I, I haven't studied the actual legislation that you're considering, um, but I uh, have long supported the energy efficiency standards in Act 250. One of my first jobs in Vermont government actually was I was executive director of the Environmental Board uh, and, and learned about that program then, and and I would say for for uh, new construction in Vermont, we should definitely adhere to uh, high standards. I don't know if they need to be perfectly high, but high standards to encourage efficiency. So, I have So, the two cents a gallon on gas for light duty vehicles. Where are we going to get these vehicles? Because I have a Honda CRV, and I those electric vehicles. Where are we going to get them? Speak well, you can go to Shearer Chevrolet if you want. You can go to the Chevrolet dealership in Barrie. You can go online and buy a used EV 
for seven or eight thousand dollars. One that's just come off a lease. Wow. It's got thirty thousand miles on it and plenty of life left. And with the technology growing, smaller battery vehicles are being put to the side, and people are getting newer, nicer vehicles. But there, there are a lot of EVs out there. Um, we just happen not to see them because there aren't a lot of them in Vermont. Where are there a lot? Massachusetts, California. Actually, per capita, Vermont's doing pretty well. Uh, the, the uptake in EVs is pretty good in Vermont, but um, it's uh, it's it's slowly growing. Last year, 200,000 EVs, I think, were purchased across the U.S. We have Representative Dolan and then Representative McCullough. I'm I'm really intrigued by your focus on um, I mean, even. Putting carbon aside, that's a benefit. That's an extra, because the real benefit is to the resident that is living in a in a drafty house, <laughs> and uh, they're uncomfortable. Much of their income is going to pay for heating, and um, and it's expensive. So what you're implying is this: there are strategic ways that we can make uh, policy decisions that can meet result in helping Vermont residents keep money in their pockets. That's absolutely essential here. We have an affordability issue. Uh, we hear often that um, affordability, people are struggling whether it's their mortgage or whether it's their um, their rent. And, um, and so this, these are real strategies too to help us address affordability. Do you have any um, information regarding the, the percentage of, a, of the households that, uh, percentage of their, um, their, perhaps their income that is, goes towards just their basic necessities of keeping the lights on or, or their houses heated? I don't, I don't. Is there anything like that? Oh, yeah. No, we, there we, must be there somewhere, is. right? Because um, uh, that would be critical. We do know on the climate side, it's the second largest sector, sector in terms of contributing. But this seems to be a win-win a strategy if we could determine how to best finance it um, in terms of saving Vermonters money and making um, our places of abode more affordable. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't have those figures. We can get them. Certainly, other representatives are probably better than we. You know, uh, right. Certainly, uh, the uh, weatherization assistance program folks, they know those numbers inside out. Uh, you, should have, you should certainly talk to them. Thank you. Yeah, and it, it varies quite a lot by, by well, yeah. housing type and, and income category. I was just going to add that the, the same observation applies to um, electric vehicles. So many Vermonters are rural. They, they drive a lot to get to work, to get to the doctors, to get to a restaurant, to, to do anything. And they pay more, probably more out of their income to fix their trucks, to fix their cars. So that to the degree you can get them into EVs that have lower maintenance costs, lower o and costs, the sooner you can do that, the more money they're going to keep in their pockets. Now, we have another meeting, but we can split if you still have questions. One of us can stay or two, and it's up to you. Let's see. Are there more questions? Okay. Yeah. Um, so the delivered fuel tax yeah. um, could benefit. It would, would you recommend an excise tax for that? On yes. Okay. I rec we, we collect now a gross receipts tax mm -hmm. that supports the weatherization program. And so that's a uh, wholesale level okay. essentially yeah. and I would recommend uh, extending that for the purposes and I want to be clear here Point not yeah, for the purposes of saving homeowners money on fuel totally and and there must be models that, that you didn't include public transportation the opportunity to invest those dollars in public transportation and maybe heavy rail Yep, we didn't. We didn't, look, that and let yeah, we didn't, we didn't look at Thank those. You. Thank you. We, we, there was, the menu was really huge. big, huge, and so we just picked ones that we thought would be, uh, frankly, would have a significant bang for the buck in Vermont from the get-go. That's 
that we then make that judgment call given the time and resources that we're able to put to it. Heavy rail probably coming from everywhere else through Vermont. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Then I can go. Uh, thank you very much. Look, we're more than happy to come back, answer any of your questions. If you get a, if you get a chance to go through the report, and, and there are, I reread it and I am, I'm asking questions. So by all means, we're more than happy to uh, come back or be on call in any, in any way. Feel free. Uh, our contact information, I think, is in there. Thank you very much for the time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Can I follow you out and ask a question? Yeah, please. please.